Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. I guess in a way I could look at it as an early Christmas present. If it wasn't for the overwhelming craving for raw meat, not being able to control my actions, an incredibly painful transformation. Oh, and there is the whole having to fight to the death against her older sisters and their lovers. Apparently, they want to sacrifice her to some demon fuck to fulfill an old family tradition. Yeah, there are really only negatives thinking about it now. But the things we do for love and all that? It all started when I met this girl, Ari. She worked part-time at the library of the university I attended. I would go there on occasion to study and generally just to relax. I'll be the first to say I'm not great at making friends. Just talking to people in general is a hassle for me if I'm honest. Especially when it comes to talking with women, I'll tell you. I was the champion of missed relationship opportunities. With Ari, it was different. She was the one who initially approached me. It was just small chats here and there since we saw each other pretty regularly. I'd also help her study when I found out she was struggling with a few courses that I did pretty well in. Eventually, I asked her out. She rejected me. She said she wasn't looking to have a relationship. It wasn't something she wanted, and I was all right with that. For about a year after, we would regularly do things together. It got to the point where we were essentially dating, though without the label. I remember bringing this up with Ari at one point. We'd then have this strange conversation where she told me she wanted to have a relationship, just that she didn't want to ruin my life. I laughed at the time, thinking about how she could possibly do that. Ari didn't laugh about it. Then we jumped to a couple weeks ago when I learned just what she meant. We were out that night with some friends at a local bar to celebrate a birthday. Her birthday. It was the day she turned 21. After most everyone had left to head home, I found Ari sulking near the windows, just staring into her reflection. I could tell she was miles away mentally. I took a seat across from her. She had been upbeat for most of the night, so seeing her depressed like this was concerning. What's got you so down? I asked, taking a glance outside at the snow-covered city streets. My sister is going to kill me, she answered. Why, do something to piss her off? Ari let out a laugh and shook her head. No, it's just my family being themselves. Anything I can do to help? Kind of a drag to see you down like this on your own birthday, I said. She tilted her head towards me. Can you come with me somewhere? I don't want to be alone tonight. We ended up driving out of the city, taking numerous side roads and turns. I was unsure of where we were even at, but I trusted Ari. Ari parked the car when we arrived at this parking lot high up on a hill overlooking the city. We were miles and miles away, the city only some bright lights in the distance. There was no one else out there, just us. So, something you wanted to talk about? I asked. I hadn't noticed it on the drive over, but Ari was in tears. She looked over at me, her lips quivering. I... I'm sorry. Ari muttered, before quickly pressing her lips to mine. She crawled over the seat on top of me and began undressing. Wait! Why are you doing this? I asked, pulling my face away from her. I need this. Was all she said and continued kissing me. I accepted it. It was something I had wanted for a long time, and I went along with it. After it was over, the two of us were lying together in the back of her car. She hadn't stopped crying, and now she was even more of a wreck. I couldn't help but feel awful like I had taken advantage of her. This wasn't the situation I wanted. It's going to hurt. Ari sobbed. What is? I asked. The transformation. After she said that, I felt a surge of nausea rush over me. Not wanting to vomit in her car, I quickly opened up the back door and spewed out onto the ground. I thought I would only vomit a bit, but it kept coming and coming. I fell out of the car into the mess, and this agonizing pain racked my entire body as my skin felt like it had been lit on fire. I screamed in pain as I crawled across the ground. There was something very wrong that was happening to me. I looked back at Ari and noticed she was holding up her hand. It had this dim purple glow emanating from her palm. What? What are you? I couldn't finish my sentence before vomiting even more. 
What was coming up now was not food or alcohol anymore. It was blood. My stomach felt as if it was being ripped to pieces. I tried to beg Ari for help, between the bouts of vomiting and debilitating pain, but she only watched me. It will be over soon, you're going to be okay, I heard her say, her voice sounding muffled. I legitimately thought that I was going to die, that this was it. I continued to beg and plead Ari to do something to help. She was chanting at that point, some words that I couldn't discern, each syllable striking me with yet more pain. The bones in my arms, my legs were being broken and reshaped. Even my skull I could feel was becoming malformed. My teeth were pushed out of my gums as other longer sharper teeth took their place. I watched as my skin peeled open and beneath the blood and tissue I saw black fur. The last thing I remember before everything going black was Eerie continuing to apologize. I woke up in the middle of some field miles away from where we were. I was completely naked and lying down beside the massacred corpses of what I think were three cows. They were all stacked in a pile, their bodies ripped to pieces. Organs and limbs were strewn about the place. Blood pooled about a good foot in the divot of the ground I was lying in. Needless to say, waking up covered in blood and guts, not to mention naked, sent me into an immediate panic. I crawled through the snow away from the dead cattle and scrambled to my feet. Hey, I recognized the voice as Ares turning around. I saw her holding a towel in a bag. I brought your clothes. You're gonna need a shower, but wiping off what you can's going to have to work till then. We should also get out of here before the rancher notices this mess. After cleaning myself off as best I could, I followed her back to her car. And the moment we were inside, I asked, What the hell happened? You transformed, she said, not even looking over at me. Transformed? I wasn't lying to you when I said my sister was going to kill me. My family is cursed by a demon. Every generation. When the final daughter that the current matriarch has turns 21, she is forced to fight her older sisters. Only the strongest daughter has the right to continue the family lineage. So if the youngest dies, then the now youngest daughter takes her place, and the cycle continues until there is only one daughter left. Those that die serve as a sacrifice to the demon who cursed our family. The fuck are you talking about? Is this some joke? What the hell does that have to do with me? I yelled. I'm not lying to you. I know it's confusing. Confusing. I woke up covered in gore with no idea how the hell I got there. I am a little more than just confused. I cut off Airy. I was just boiling with anger inside. Just let me explain, please. I don't care if you don't believe me, but you can at least let me explain it to you. Airy said. I could see she was the brink of breaking down. Fine, explain it to me then. I scoffed. We're witches, Kevin. I am. My sisters are. Our mother is. As was my grandmother and her mother and so on and so on. That was the trade-off for the curse. However, our power is limited if we are alone. So, to enhance our abilities, we take on familiars. But you can only turn a person you love, really love, into a familiar. And the catch is that they have to love you back. If that happens then, after you have sex with them, they will be turned into a familiar. So what you're saying is I'm your familiar? I asked. Airy nodded. What happened to me? Just please tell me. After I said that, I noticed Airy's eyes drop down to her lap. When a person turns into a familiar, it's unknown what they will turn into. But it's always a monster. We have no idea what that monster will be till it happens. Her fingers gripped tight into her jeans. Air, what did I turn into? Airy took out her phone and brought up a video she had taken some time after I had transformed and handed it to me. I figured if you didn't see it for yourself, you wouldn't believe it. The video started with her walking through the field I woke up in. I could hear her ragged breathing behind the camera. Clearly she was terrified. The only light she had to guide her way was a small flashlight. Kevin, Airy called out. There was no response until about a minute later when this low-pitched howl reverberated through the speakers. It was close by, judging by how loud it was. Then there was this god-awful screaming coming from something in the field, sounding as though it was getting tortured. The severed leg of one of the cows came into view, and Ares' breathing intensified. No, it wasn't supposed to be like this, she said. Pointing the camera up, Ares stopped in front of a pair of glowing red eyes, 
peering at her from the darkness. Whatever was in front of her was snarling, ready to attack. Kevin, it's me, I'm not gonna hurt you. Ari's voice was filled with fear. Whatever was in the shadows lunged forward and I could only get a short glimpse of it. It was covered with black fur and had the head of a wolf. It was huge, much bigger than any wolf should have been and standing on two feet. This creature tackled Ari to the ground, causing the phone to go bouncing across the grass. While I couldn't see what was happening, I could hear it. Ari was crying out in pain for the thing to stop attacking her, for me to stop attacking her. Her cries soon turned to screams, and I had to stop the video. My hands were trembling and I felt sick to my stomach. I looked over at Ari and could see she was holding onto her arm. I lifted up her sleeve and saw she had bloodied bandages wrapped around it. Oh God, I said softly. I felt as though the world around me was bending and shifting. To think that I would end up hurting Ari shoved a knife of sorrow through my chest. Don't worry, we heal pretty quick, I'll be okay. Can you turn me back to normal? I asked. Ari shook her head. Once the process is done, there's no reversing it. What if I kill somebody? What if I end up killing you? I tried to keep myself under control, but I was a mess. An anxious and scared mess. You won't. As long as you don't transform, things will be okay, Ari retorted. Why? Why would you do this to me? I don't want to die, Kevin. Why is that so hard for you to understand? Doing this to you was my only option. I'd never have been able to fight my sisters without a familiar. Believe me, I never wanted to drag you into this. I tried to accept that I was going to die. But yesterday, I, I just felt so afraid. It's not fair. I never asked to be born into this fucking family. I'm sorry, Kevin, but I need you. It was clear she meant every word she had said. I was just in a daze from all of the information overload. The only thing I could understand was that Ari genuinely thought she was in danger. Seeing how upset she'd got, I couldn't help but feel sympathetic. There was nothing I could do to change what happened to me. While I was far from accepting it, I knew there were other concerns. Can we just head back to the city? I don't want to be out here any longer, I said. We can head back to my apartment, you can get cleaned up there. Ari started up the car, and we began our drive back. I guess I can't really go around campus covered with some dry blood. People would be a little concerned. Hey, what did you mean when you said it wasn't supposed to be like this? In the video? I asked. We were unlucky. Usually a familiar can still control themselves when they are transformed. For you to become something so... wild, it's rare. But you can control it if you just keep your emotions in check. You want to avoid becoming too afraid or angry. The monster feeds on those negative emotions. So, I got a werewolf tagging along in my body now just hanging out? I said sarcastically. Sort of, but I wouldn't say it is the same as a werewolf. The full moon doesn't matter for the transformation. That's good to know. I was just thinking of how much of a pain it would be to have to schedule around the lunar cycle. And your sisters? What's the plan with them? They get to decide when to try and kill me and how to do it. All I can do is wait for them to make their move. There's an order to be followed, so only one of my sisters will be trying to kill me at a time. They can only wait for 30 days before making a move any longer, and they would end up being killed, Eri explained. Killed by what? I asked. Her only response was to shrug her shoulders. No one knows. All right, how many sisters do you have, if you don't mind me asking? Nine. Nine? Holy shit, are you close with them at all? I mean... They're going to try to kill you. I imagine there would be a little distance. The moment I said that, I felt Ari's phone vibrate in my hand. I noticed that a text had come through. I probably shouldn't have read the text, not wanting to invade her privacy and all, but I couldn't stop myself when I looked down at the screen. And hey E, just letting you know I got those movie tickets reserved for this weekend. The text read, I looked at the sender and saw the name, Miranda. She is... I said, holding up Ari's phone to her and pointing at the name. One of my sisters, Ari said, taking the phone from me. You're going to the movies with her? She's going to try to kill you and you're going to the movies together. Miranda is the third oldest daughter her turn won't be for a while, so she has no reason to kill me. It really isn't all that weird. I mean, 
We had a family get together for Thanksgiving, and I just went bowling with Jennifer, my fourth oldest sister, last weekend. I mean, I still love them and all. It's just that things have to be this way. There's nothing any of us can do about it. It's just a fucked up fate. Doesn't mean we can't enjoy the time we have left together, Harry said. The idea that they would still try to be a family even when they knew what was going to happen was insane to me. I'd have thought you'd want to disassociate yourself as much as possible. So that when the time came, you didn't feel anything when you inevitably had to murder each other. Ares' family didn't see this tradition of theirs like that, though. They tried to be a family in spite of it. They would try to be decent people in spite of it. But I would soon come to find that everyone in the family shared this common view. When we got back into the city, and to Ares' apartment complex, she parked outside, and I followed her through the building to her apartment. I had only ever been to her apartment a couple of times. She lived with a roommate, so she wanted to try not to disturb her when possible. We got to her door and when we went inside, I was hit with the immediate stench of marijuana. Aerie shut the door and sighed, walking past me and into the common area of the apartment. I told you to open the windows if you're gonna do that shit here, Aerie said as she went to open a couple windows. Ah shit, sorry Aerie, you know I forget stuff. I had a man's voice and walked in to see a hippie looking man lounging on a sofa, joint hanging lazily from his mouth as he watched television. Oh, hey, bro, he said to me, not turning his head to look at me. You're back. You get my text? A young woman dressed in some black clothing and sporting some pretty dark makeup walked in from the hall. When she saw me, there was a look of surprise on her face. Oh, you must be Kevin. He told me all about you. The woman examined me closer. I think she was taking in all of the dried blood that still covered a good part of my face and hands. An inquisitive expression formed on her face as she looked back at Airy. You, uh, did? Airy nodded in response. Huh. Well, it's nice to meet you, Kevin. I'm Miranda, Airy's sister. That lazy ass on the couch is my boyfriend, Victor. You live together, huh? Sorry, I just... You're planning on killing her, right? I asked. She already told you all that. At some point, I'll have to try, I guess. It's not like I want to or anything. Miranda leaned against the wall and frowned. I didn't know how to respond. All of this was just so insane to me. Aerie led me to the bathroom so I could wash up. It was nice to finally get all of the blood off. Pretty tricky with how stuck on it had become. Felt like I had to nearly scrub my skin off. Even after that shower, I still didn't feel fully clean, but I'd feel bad running up their water bill. When I hopped out of the shower, I noticed the mirror hanging above the sink. I wiped away the fog and took a look at myself. I had always had a scar on my shoulder ever since I was eight years old. It was from this huge stray dog that attacked me and a couple friends. It had bitten into my shoulder and punctured a decent few holes into it. I remember how afraid I was at that moment since then. I've never been comfortable around dogs, especially big ones. The scar from that attack was completely gone now like it never happened. At that point, the reality of the situation came crashing down on me. I could have murdered Ari well before her sisters even got the chance. I could have woken up surrounding by the bodies of the family living at that ranch, instead of a few cows. Knowing what I know now, it was a miracle that wasn't the case. I had thought it was strange that the rancher never heard his cattle being slaughtered. Turns out he did, but Ari convinced him not to investigate and let her handle it. I got dressed and went back out to the living room and found that only Miranda was here. She was lounging on the sofa, reading through some medical textbook. If you're curious, Aerie went to work. She wanted to take you with her, but she was already running really late. Looks like I'm walking back then, I sighed. I can give you a ride over if you want, Miranda offered. I could tell by her expression she saw my apprehension about taking her up on that. You don't trust me, I take it. I'm still coming to terms with the fact that the girl I loved turned me into a werewolf and is a witch. I don't know where to begin with the whole family blood prophecy shit. I mean, it sounds like the plot to a B-movie. Let's just say I'm not in a trusting mood today. I replied. A werewolf? Wow, that's pretty fucked, Miranda said with a laugh. So I've been told. Guess I won the lottery on transformations. Your boyfriend is he, uh... What were they called again? 
Familiar, and yeah, he's mine. What monster did he turn out to be? I shouldn't tell you, but I feel kinda inclined to since you told me about yourself. I'll give you a hint. Miranda held her index fingers behind her head like horns, and Maid nodded her head back and forth to emanate a bull. Looking at this goofy display, I had a hard time believing this girl was a witch, let alone someone capable of killing anyone. Right, I get it, you can stop now, I said, trying to hold back my laughter. Know what? I think I'll take you up on that ride. As we were driving to the campus, Miranda kept bombarding me with tidbits of information about Aerie. She just seemed like a relatively normal doting older sister who was excited to meet her little sister's boyfriend. She asked a lot of personal questions, more than I was really comfortable with answering. The more we talked, the more harmless she seemed to be. I have to ask, do you really think you could kill Ari? It seems like you really love her, I asked, as we pulled into the campus parking lot. Miranda went silent, and her face dropped. I don't know, probably not, I mean I wouldn't want to kill any of my family, just the thought of it's horrible. If I could, I would want to find another way. She responded, Is this really how it has to be? Miranda nodded her head. We've looked for another solution in the past, but nothing's worked. I noticed that a look of concern flashed across Miranda's face as she looked out the windshield. I followed her eyes and saw she was looking at this short girl who was standing with this athletic-looking guy. They were digging around in the trunk of a car. Without saying anything, Miranda got out of the car and began walking towards them. Confused, I got out and followed her. Leah? What are you doing here? Miranda asked. The short girl, Leah, turned around and glared over at Miranda. The fact that Miranda knew her name was the first thing that threw up a red flag in mind. You already know why. Who's this? A boy toy of yours? Leah said, eyeing me up and down. I looked over at the athletic dude and could see him sizing me up. It was almost like he was staring at me like a predator stalking his prey. There was something just not right with the guy. Cue the second red flag. He's a friend. The, the, this is a bit soon, don't you think? Miranda stuttered. Soon? I'd say it is as best a time as any. Leah replied. But in the daytime, here, what about all of the people? Miranda's voice was filled with anxiety. Who gives a shit about these piss ants? Ask me, I'm doing the world a favor by getting rid of a few. You're too soft, Miranda. Probably gonna make it easy on me when I get to you. Leah smirked and aimed took aim at Miranda with a finger gun. Pow! She exclaimed, pretending to shoot Miranda. It'd be so easy, wouldn't it? She then took a black suitcase out of the trunk, then slammed it closed. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to go and wish my little sister a happy birthday. Come along, Gregory. And that would be the third red flag, as I watched both Leah and Gregory walk into the campus. It didn't take me long to put two and two together and realize that Leah was here to kill Ari. After they were out of sight, Miranda grabbed onto my hand. You have to get to her quick, I can get you to her fast, but you need to trust me. What do you expect me to do? Fight them? I can't do that, I yelled. Leah's eyes were empty and soulless. She wasn't someone who would even think twice about hurting someone. I wasn't some hero. I couldn't just fight some psychopathic witch. Just warn Aerie they are coming and get her away from here, Miranda said. Can't you help her? I asked. Miranda shook her head. We can't interfere directly. The best thing I can do is get you close to Aerie. Please, Kevin, you're the only one who can help her. I don't want to lose her. Miranda begged me. I cursed myself for getting involved at all with this messed up family. But I couldn't bring myself to just abandon Aerie. Even after all of the shit that had happened, I still loved her. All right, what do you need me to do? When I said that, I could see relief come over Miranda. Close your eyes and clear your mind, Miranda said. I followed her instructions as she gripped my hand tighter and placed her other hand against my cheek. Now I want you to picture a place you think she would be at, the closest you think you can get to her. I imagined the second floor of the library, there was this area that had a bunch of tables and a few bookshelves. That was where Ari ended up spending most of her time, as they were where the most checked out books were kept. 
I'd regularly find her there, placing the books back in their places. Okay, I got it. Good luck, Kevin. Please keep her safe. In an instant, I felt this overwhelming sensation of vertigo and then found myself standing in the library. The accuracy of the teleport was a bit off as I found myself standing on a table, but it worked. Part of me was astonished by the fact that I had literally teleported. But, when I remembered the bloodthirsty short girl and her creepy fucking boyfriend coming to kill, I pushed the thought away real quick. Fuck me, where the hell did you come from? I heard a student yell who was sitting at the table I was standing on. That was some fucking Houdini shit he just pulled. Damn! There was quite the commotion going on now, but I tuned it all out as I looked around for Airy. I found her coming out from behind one of the bookshelves, probably drawn out by all the talking. I hopped off the table and ran over to her and grabbed her by the shoulders. We gotta go now, I yelled. Why, what's happening? It's your sister, she's coming for you. Suddenly, all of the lights shut off, and the library was plunged into darkness. I've noticed that people had a lot of questions concerning the curse in Ari's family. I've had my own questions about everything, too and I did get the opportunity to gain some knowledge into the situation. See, Aerie invited me to spend Christmas with her family. There was a stipulation to the visit. There was to be no killing. Yeah, I didn't buy that either at the time. Eerie's parents wanted to have one more Christmas with their daughters, at least the ones who would show up. I'll cover the visit in detail in a future post, but just know an answer to a lot of questions is that they simply have no choice. With the lights out, the chatter among the surrounding students changed from the guy randomly popping into existence to wondering why the power had gone out. There wasn't much natural light on the second floor of the library, what little bit there was, coming in through tiny slotted windows lining the tops of the library walls, some of them being placed behind bookshelves, leading them to not be very helpful. Looking around, I could barely make out the surroundings, and judging from the cursing and stuff getting knocked over, I wasn't the only one. Not even the emergency lights were working, which you'd think shouldn't happen. Hey, Houdini, this part of the act? A girl with these huge lens glasses asked, edging a bit too close into my personal space. I got studying to do, and I ain't gonna deal with some two-bit magician wannabe wasting my time. What? No, this has nothing to do with me, I said, looking over at Aerie. Sensing that I was curious if she did this, Aerie shook her head. Hey, why the hell is my phone not working? Mine isn't turning on either. I was just using it and it shut off. I could hear a few of the students say. Curious, I checked my own phone and saw it was completely dead. Glasses next to me was the same case. The same thing happened with laptops, tablets, etc. That's when I noticed that I could still hear air flowing through the vents. It wasn't that the power in the building had gone out. Instead, it was that anything that could produce light was shut off. This is your sister, right? I asked Aerie. It had to be. I mean, there was no way this was just some freak occurrence. No, Aerie answered. No? What do you mean, no? I asked, obviously confused. It's... it's all part of the curse, I think. I'd only heard a little about it from my mother. She said he likes to be entertained. She'd tell me about vehicles suddenly not starting and light going dark, Aerie said. Him? You mean the demon? That motherfucker isn't happy enough with siblings killing each other. He's got to make a show out of it. So you do have something to do with this. Glasses stepped closer to me, this accusatory glint in her eyes. Back the fuck off, I shouted. I could see she was about to say something when we heard a scream coming from the stairs. They were screams emanating from the first floor of the building. At that moment, I could feel the blood running cold in my veins. The screams were horrible, tortured. I felt Aerie grasp my hand and heard her voice. We need to hide. Now, Kevin. We made our way toward the back of the library and hid behind some rows of bookshelves. You two need to tell me what the fuck is going on. Seems that glasses had followed us. Shut up, Aerie whispered angrily. A student bolted up the stairs, tripping and barely maintained their balance. While I couldn't see their face, just going off their movements alone, I could tell they were terrified. As they tried to run away from the stairs, they knocked into a chair and tumbled onto the ground. Behind them, I saw someone leisurely ascending the staircase. 
They were short in stature, with one hand pulsating a dim orange glow, and the other carrying a briefcase. Their eyes were illuminated by this pure green light. Leah, I heard Ares say under her breath. Leah lifted her hand. An orange sphere of light formed over it, hovering just above her palm. When I initially thought of witch magic, before all this shit, I was thinking of stuff like flying on a broomstick, maybe turning people into rats, a bit of levitation mixed in there. The shit you'd see witches do in movies or shows. I couldn't have been more wrong. If only their magic was that innocent. The orb darted inside of the person still on the ground in a blur. They hurried to their feet, but there was nothing they could do to stop it. They erupted into flames, brilliantly lighting up a good half of the floor. I could see now that without a doubt, the person who caused it was Leah. She watched this woman burn alive with a smile on her face. I'd found out now why all those people were screaming like they were. After several agonizing seconds, the woman collapsed into a mass of burnt flesh. I was so terrified at that point my legs nearly gave out. What the hell do you even do against that? Against someone who just with a flick of their wrist can subject you to one of the most painful deaths imaginable. The fight or flight instincts kicked in for the rest of the students on the floor and chaos erupted. A few of them made a break for the elevator, not wanting to try and go past Leah. Maybe they realized the power was still on, or perhaps they just weren't thinking straight and wanted to get away from Leah as fast as they could. One student picked up a chair and threw it at Leah. She caught it, like it didn't weigh a thing. She grabbed it with one hand. The chair ignited in her hands and she threw it back at the student. When the chair impacted him, it shattered it into pieces and spreading the flame all over his body. Watching the fire travel across his body, it seemed like it was a living entity with how it consumed his entire body within moments. The doors to the elevator finally opened, but the students that tried to use it found it to be occupied. From the angle I was at, I couldn't make out the inside of the elevator. Whatever was in there caused the students to flee away from it in terror. Two of them were able to anyway, one of them had been grabbed by the thing emerging from the elevator. The light inside the elevator functioned, allowing me to make out the features of the abomination that stepped out. The simplest way I could describe it was that it was a pigman. It was huge and hulking. One hand wrapped entirely around this poor guy's head. Boils and cysts covered its fat, wrinkled body. A viscous black slime bubbling out from these pustules, falling to the floor in thick steaming chunks. The stench, like a wound that has been long infected, it was the stench decay and death. Mixed with the burning corpses, it took all I had not to vomit then and there. It was a wonder how the elevator could even carry his fat ass. The pigman squealed with glee, revealing rows of jagged teeth as he tightened his grip on the man's skull. The man's head was crushed, bits of bone, blood, and brain matter oozing from between the pigman's fingers. The man's headless body fell to the ground, and the pigman proceeded to shove his gore-covered hand into his mouth, licking it clean. I realized it then. The monstrosity was Leah's familiar, Gregory. To think that jock-looking asshole would turn into that fat beast. I'd have laughed at the irony had I not been about to shit myself. The other two students stopped in their tracks when Leah confronted them, two glowing orbs orbiting her hand. Why don't you two kneel down for me, huh? Leah said. Hesitantly, the two students followed her command, dropping to their knees. Please, one of the students sobbed. Leah looked over at her with a quizzical glance, setting the briefcase on a nearby table. Please what? Leah asked. I, I don't want to, to, to die. The student stuttered out, her voice cracking. Leah let out and opened up the case. Don't worry, people rarely do, Leah said. Kevin still with me? I heard Ari whisper. I broke my gaze away and nodded to Ari. If she finds us, I... I won't be able to fight her. I noticed Ari was clutching the side of her stomach. I remembered the injuries she had suffered just the night before. The injuries that I caused. I had only looked at her arm, but of course, that wasn't the only wound. Is there any other way off this floor besides the stairs and elevator? I asked hoping that maybe Aerie knew of some other way. She shook her head. 
Short of trying to break a window and fit through it, no there isn't. The staircase was all the way across the room from where we were. Trying to make a run for that we'd be caught out in the open. Even if those balls of spontaneous combustion didn't fuck us over, the pig fuck definitely would. My eyes trailed over to the still open elevator. That was the closest escape. We would again be moving into the open but for much less time. We could try for the elevator. Shit that would only take us to the first floor, wouldn't it? They could easily catch up to us. I said, no, I think that could work. We can use it to head to the basement. Usually, only maintenance staff head down there. It's essentially a bunch of tunnels and storage areas connecting the E to the rest of the buildings on the campus, Harry replied. Thinking about it, I only need one of you alive, don't I? I turned my attention back to Leah. She was holding in her hand small statuette. It was hard to tell what it was supposed to be of at this distance, but that wouldn't matter for long. The statuette burst in flames and these flames coalesced themselves into an animal, a cat formed of fire with blackened eyes. The cat wandered up Leah's arm and rubbed its head against Leah's cheek. He's cute, isn't he? Why don't you give him a home? Leah said. The cat jumped off of her shoulder and approached one of the students. He tried to back away from it, but the cat pounced on him and began digging into his chest. It burrowed its way into the guy disappearing inside of his body. The man's fingers coiled, his skin cracked, an orange glow shining out from inside the crevices. The orange light blazed out from inside his mouth and fire burst from his eyes. The man's body started to crackle and convulse before it awkwardly dragged itself up off of the ground. I thought he'd have to be dead after that, but he was standing. His body had been commandeered by that psycho bitch's pet cat. At this point, the absurdity of the situation had worn its welcome. Huh? Where are you trying to scurry off to? Leah asked. The other student had started to try and crawl away towards the stairs. Gregory walked over to her, dragging her back and lifting her off the ground. No, stop. Just let me go. She cried out. I could hear the sound of her nails dragging across the carpet as she desperately tried to get away from Gregory. He lifted her up until she was at eye level with him. She screamed in terror as Gregory sniffed her face, letting out a squeal as he did. Say I still haven't asked you my question yet. Trying to leave is a little rude, don't you think? Leah strolled over to the girl. I'm looking for my sister, Ari Revenholt. She should be around here, hiding, of course. To be honest, I'm a little surprised she hasn't come out. I thought she'd have some compassion for her fellow students. Leah shrugged. Guess she's more cowardly than I expected. God damn it. Ari clutched her arm and gritted her teeth. Ari isn't a coward, she was far from one. I could tell she wanted to help. I could see the weight of the guilt she must have felt knowing that her sister was there for her, and all of these other people were just collateral damage. But there was nothing she could do to stop her. If she tried, she'd only succeed in getting herself killed. At that moment, I felt this immense worthlessness. I tried to play it off in my head. I didn't ask for any of this to happen. Even if I had injured Aerie, it wasn't my fault. She was the one who turned me into that monster. I had no choice in the matter. Why was it then as I watched that girl struggling that I felt it was my fault? Like I was just letting this happen. I dropped down to my knees and felt something wet touching my knee. Looking down, I saw a trail of liquid. I followed the trail to glasses. She was clutching her knees to her chest, back pressed against the bookshelf in a puddle of her own making. She was talking to herself, her eyes staring at nothing. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. How long had she been chanting that to herself, I wonder? Then the thought dug its way into my brain, seizing my attention. I was going to die here, die a horrible death at the hands of something I didn't even understand. There was no stopping it. The hairs on the back of my neck began to stand up, and I felt a rising, scratching sensation in my stomach. Where's she hiding at, huh? Tell me quick now, Leah asked. I, I don't know, the girl yelled. That's not what I like to hear. Leah nodded to Gregory. His mouth opened and spit ran from his maw, dripping down into puddles on the floor. Over there, the girl yelled, pointing the bookshelf we were hiding behind. My heart stopped as Leah glanced over in our direction. Then she laughed. I can tell you're guessing. I hate people that guess you can have her, Leah said. 
Gregory began bringing the girl closer and closer to his open mouth. The girl cried out and pleaded as she tried to push herself away from him. Her hands suddenly slipped past his face and went inside his mouth. Gregory bit down, severing her arm up to her elbows. Those screams, those fucking screams, they pierced through my body. Airy darted past me and I watched her place her hand over Glass's mouth, just in time to muffle her screams of horror. Airy held onto Glass's tight and covered her eyes. You need to stay calm, she cannot find us, Airy said. Muscle sinew hung loosely around the exposed broken bone of the girl's arms. Blood oozed out from between Gregory's lips as he chewed. He then opened his mouth wide, so wide that he fit half of girl's head into his mouth. Please stop. I don't want... Before the girl could finish her plea, Gregory bit down and consuming the entire front half of her head. Her screams had stopped, but watching him eat her body, it started to break me. This thing could have never been human in the past. I refused to believe it. How could someone this fucked actually exist? They were monsters. Both of them were. I fell backward, my vision starting to blur as I felt that scratching sensation turn into a painful one. I gripped my stomach, feeling nausea beginning to overtake me. Kevin, I need you. It's time to go. Ari placed her hands on my cheeks and forced me to look at her. We can get through this. I nodded. I wasn't going to die here. Not like this. The nausea started to subside, and I got back up to my feet. I looked over to the elevator. I noticed that the flaming student was now wandering to the opposite corner of the library, checking behind the bookshelves. I heard screams come from where it was looking and watched as a couple student ran out of their hiding place, only to be met by Leah. She had two more of those statuettes in her hand. They exploded to life, giving birth to a pair of cats. The cats leapt forward, diving into the two students, turning both their bodies into burning possessed husks. After they finished turning, she motioned for the molten students to check another side of the room. Eerie was right. It was only a matter of time before we were found. Can you run? I asked, turning to Harry. Um, I, I don't think so, she replied. All right, I'll carry you on my back, I said. Eerie nodded and knelt down next to Glasses. We're getting out of here. You need to come with us. Eerie placed her hand on Glasses' shoulder. No, I can't. I can't. Glasses began to shake her head frantically tears and snot streaming down her face. If you stay here, they will find you. You need to trust me, okay? Glasses sniffled and nodded her head. Ari helped her to her feet. You need to follow us as close as you can, okay? There were more screams from across the room. I quickly lifted Ari onto my back, and we got as close as we could towards the elevator before coming out of our cover. The molten students were dragging people towards the center of the room to be either burned or possessed as Leah saw fit. The elevator doors were wide open, light shining forth from it like a beacon. We are going to make a break for it on three, I said to Glasses, who was huddled close behind me. One, two, three. I bolted out from behind the bookshelf and ran as fast as my feet would allow me. With all the adrenaline pumping through my veins, I hardly felt Aries' weight. The only thing on my mind was getting to that damn elevator. Sister, Leah noticed us, and I saw numerous of those orange orbs hurtling towards us. I thought for sure we were fucked, but then Aerie raised up her hand towards the approaching balls of burning death. A dim purple aura surrounded Aerie's right hand, and as the orbs were almost on top of us, I felt a force of some kind push me off balance, almost causing me to fall over. The spheres all scattered, careening into the floor, ceiling, and a few shelves, causing flames to spread where they went. Gregory, Leah yelled. We were right in front of the elevator when something flew by me and slammed into the back of the elevator. It was the half-eaten corpse of the girl that Gregory had killed. I rushed into the elevator and saw that Glasses had stopped just outside, her eyes fixated on the body. Seeing Gregory charging towards us, I grabbed Glasses by the arm and yanked her into the elevator, then slammed my fist on the button for the basement level. It was a stupid thing now that I think about to try for the elevator. The doors would take far too long to close. And that monstrosity was sprinting at us with a speed that should have been impossible for his size. 
I prayed for the doors to close faster, seeing Gregory getting closer and closer, but he was going to be here before they did. Mary raised her hand up again, and the purple glow that surrounded it brightened. She let out a scream of pain as I felt myself being pushed backward by some unseen force. Gregory suddenly stopped in his tracks and began sliding back. Once he regained control of his movement, he tried again to charge the elevator, but the doors closed before he could get close enough. As the elevator descended, a slight sense of relief came over me. I took a look over at Airy and saw her arm hanging down, limp. Blood was dripping down from her fingertips. Whatever it was that she did had saved us, but took a heavy toll on her body. Are you going to be okay? I asked. Don't worry about me, Aries said through labored breaths. That was an easy thing to say, but I could tell she was barely even able to maintain consciousness. It was apparent she wouldn't be able to keep doing something like that. Hell, she couldn't do it again. Behind me, I heard glasses vomit in the corner of the elevator, trying her best to not look at the body. As the doors opened up to the basement, I wondered just how in the hell we were going to get through this. Man, I missed last month, where my biggest fear was being caught beating my meat by my roommate. The only risk there was embarrassment and things becoming incredibly awkward for a little while. Not like I'd end up dead from that or anything. What an innocent, wholesome sort of fear to have in comparison to the shit I deal with now. Which brings me to a recent thought I've been having. What to do with these posts if I end up being killed? I mean, I guess they would just stop. The odds are pretty stacked against us, Ari and I, that is. You kill one sister and all you do is reset that timer on the next encounter to 30 days. It's exhausting, fearing that any day now you could die. I tend not to sleep much during the night anymore, too much anxiety. Eerie has it worse than me. She's the one being directly targeted. I think that maybe I'll try to set up something like a dead man's switch. Have it post something in the case I become... unable to. It's something for me to think about while I have a bit of downtime. Eh? I shouldn't think so negatively. I don't have any plans on dying with shit I still want to do in life. I'll get back to recollecting now. I've wasted enough of your time with my rambling. The basement was, surprise surprise, dark. It would have been pitch black actually had it not been for the light from the elevator. The elevator opened at an intersection of two corridors. I saw the doors start to close again and stuck my foot in the way to force them to open again. I wasn't about to take a trip back up to meet Piggy again. I was hesitant to get out, but we had little choice. I stepped out and looked around for something blocked the elevator doors from closing, but with how dark it was, I couldn't see anything nearby. That's when I turned back and saw the half-eaten corpse. I, I, can you move that in front of the doors, I asked Glasses. Seeing as I was still carrying Aerie, I couldn't do it. You can't be serious. Glasses gave me a disgusted look. I get it, it's not something I'd want to do, but if you don't want to end up like her, then we need to block the doors. Reluctantly, Glasses grabbed one of the legs of the corpse and dragged it halfway out of the elevator, holding a hand over her mouth and nose the whole time. Once she was done, she moved away from it as fast as she could, gagging. Taking a look left, right, and forward, I tried to figure out which way to go. It would be pretty bad for us if we went in the direction of the stairs down here from the library. Not being able to see a thing, though, would mean any way we picked to go, we would end up blind. Wish we had a little light, I muttered. Oh, I got something that could help. Glasses pulled out a pocket lighter and ignited it. The light that it gave off was pitifully tiny, but a little light was better than nothing. Airy, any ideas where to go? I asked. I've never been down here, but if we go forward, we should be heading towards the administration building. Airy said, Forward it is. You got the light. You should take the lead. I nodded over to Glasses. Did, did, do I have to? <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be following right behind you. We're going to have to take it slow anyway, I said. Okay. Glasses hesitantly began walking down the corridor. Before leaving the light of the elevator, I took another look at Aerie. The right sleeve of her jacket was now completely drenched with blood. Looking down, I could see it was dripping down onto the floor. Something needed to be done about her injury. Not only because of how severe it was, 
but it would also leave a trail right to us. I caught up with glasses, and right as I got behind her, there was this loud crash from behind us. Something huge had landed on top of the elevator, and I had a pretty good idea of what it was. Gregory coming to try and get another meal. Glasses screamed, nearly collapsing at the noise. I gotta give it to the fat fuck. He knows how to make an entrance. Find a room now, I yelled to Glasses. My hope was that we could hide out in one of the storage rooms. She started rushing down the wall, running the lighter along it in search of a door. Over here, Glasses yelled, as whatever was on top of the elevator attempted to get inside of it. I ran over to her as fast as I could and we took shelter inside the room. With the little light, I couldn't really make out much of the room. There didn't seem to be much to it. Two shelves on either side of the room, filled with all manner of miscellaneous junk and an empty wall across from the door. I carefully sat airy against the wall and propped myself up against the door. I listened carefully for any movement. That's when I heard Gregory finally drop down into the elevator. I prayed hard he would be too stupid to notice the blood trail and follow it. Glasses killed the lighter, engulfing the three of us in darkness. I heard Gregory start down the corridor, the sound of loud snorting growing as he drew closer and closer to the door. Then, he stopped right in front of the door. I heard him let out a light squeal and sniff the door. I could see, underneath the door, a dim orange light. Then the orange light dissipated, and the sound of Gregory's footsteps disappeared further down the hall. I gasped for air, not realizing I had been holding my breath that entire time. Glasses flicked the lighter back on, taking one look at her. I was sure she would have pissed herself again if she could have. I moved over to Erie, intending to take a look at her arm. Can you bring that light a bit closer, I asked. Glasses came over and knelt down next to Aerie and I. I began to roll Aerie's bloody sleeve up. It wasn't easy with all the blood causing it to stick to her arm. As I got the sleeve halfway up her arm, I realized how horrific the injury actually was. Pieces of bone were jutting out from beneath Aerie's skin all the way up and down her arm. There was one particularly bad area where the bone was sticking a good inch out of her arm. I reeled back a bit from the sight. Oh my fuck, I heard Glasses exclaim under her breath, bringing her hands to her mouth. It was a wonder how the hell Airy was so composed, let alone still conscious with those injuries. It's not that bad, really, I barely feel it, Airy said, noticing our reactions. Easy to say when you haven't seen it, I replied. Behind me, Glasses was taking off her shoes and socks. What are you doing? I asked, confused. We should dress the wound, right? I, I was going to use my socks. It was quick thinking on her part, and it wasn't like there was much else for us to use. Glasses folded one of her socks several times, then placed it over the worse open fracture. Airy took a sharp breath and gritted her teeth. Can you hold this for me? Glasses turned to me and nodded towards the folded sock. I gently pressed down on it, while she started to wrap the other sock around it. I'm sorry, this is all my fault, Airy said. No, it's not. This is all part of that curse, isn't it? There's nothing you can do about that. You're just a victim of it, I said. Eerie was crying at this point. I thought at first it was because of the pain she had to be in, but the more I looked at her, I realized the pain on her face wasn't physical. It was much deeper than that. We need to keep moving. If we stay still for too long, she'll be able to find us. It's part of being the one tasked to kill, though she'll only be able to narrow me down to a general area, Eerie said another part of the curse. How many of these stipulations were there I had to wonder. After we get out of this, you're going to tell me everything about this stupid curse, I said. You're right, I owe you that. I'll tell you everything I can. Before that, we need to kill Leah here. I, I can't let her keep killing people. Hearing Aries say that caught me off guard for some reason. Maybe it was just the sheer seriousness in her voice. The thought of her killing someone had never entered my mind before. Even when this whole curse first came up, I never imagined her being capable of doing that. Thing is, in this situation it wouldn't be her doing it. She was much too weak to put up any kind of fight against Leah, let alone Gregory, or the numerous possessed students. No, there was only one possibility for dealing with all of them. Realizing that my heart began to sink, I felt Airy grasp my hand. It's the only way. If you don't do this, we... We... 
I interrupted Aerie. Why is it we? You're the one who dragged me into this situation. I was pissed. Why should I have to put my life on the line? None of it was fair, the transformation, being hunted down. Why was I the one that needed to bail us out? I didn't ask for any of this. You're right, I shouldn't have to ask you for anything. If you want, you can leave me here. Even if I die, you can go on living your life. No one will come for you. Hearing this, I felt my throat start burning. There was a part of me that wanted to leave, to abandon her. I felt a few tears start rolling down my cheeks. I gripped Ari's hand tighter and leaned in and kissed her. After pulling away, she was looking up at me, surprised. I can't do that. What, what do you expect me to do? I, I love you. How could I live with myself if I just left you to die? I said. A short aside, I'd say I'm a dumbass more than anything else. Most people probably wouldn't value love this much, especially not with a girl they only just started dating. I'm not going to argue the logic of it, because there isn't any. My decision to help Ari is almost certainly the stupidest decision I will ever make in this lifetime. Perhaps not having a girlfriend before this point had just completely ruined my sense of reason when it came to relationships. Not that I care. I made the decision and I'm living with it. Whether I regret it or not, guess we'll find out. I, I finished wrapping the wound. I just, uh, didn't want to interrupt you two and your, uh, little moment. Though I wouldn't mind being told what the fuck is happening. Glasses said. It's really complicated. I replied. When we get out of this, I can tell you about it. We're gonna need your help too. Airy said. I... I guess I can help. Glasses said, reluctantly. That's okay. I thought you want to get out of here. Why help us? I asked. I don't know. It's kind of exciting. Exciting? You pissed yourself and could end up being eaten by a pigman. I wouldn't call that very exciting. I noticed Glasses getting embarrassed by my retort. Yeah, it's terrifying, but I just feel like... Glasses furrowed her brow. I feel like I should do something, you know. Besides, without you two, up in the library, I... I owe you, okay? Suit yourself. If you want to be stupid, I won't get in your way. Like I was really one to talk. Airy. I assume you have a plan. Aerie nodded her head. We will trap them somewhere with you, Kevin. If we get them into a place with only one exit, I can use my still working arm to seal the door. The seal wouldn't last long. That is if Leah's familiar were to be beating on the door, but since he should be dead, it shouldn't matter. As for Leah's magic, if we use a room hooked up to the sprinkler system, it should render her unable to use it. She can't use her magic if she's wet? I asked, astonished she would have such a glaringly large weakness. Right, Eri said. That's how it works as I came to learn. Each witch has some weakness, something that will completely take away their abilities, albeit for a limited amount of time. It was fortunate that Eri knew of Leah's weakness, though I imagine it would be a hard one to hide. Thinking about it, it was incredible she didn't manage to set off any of the sprinklers in the library, but the fire that she used was very controlled. I mean, she must have taken the risk into account deciding to go on a rampage like she did. You have a place in mind? Airy looked to be trying to think of a place when Glasses spoke up. You could use one of the gym's locker rooms. That would work. There also shouldn't be anyone using it today. It would mean that we could avoid more people dying, Airy said. How are we going to get there, though? I asked. It's dark as fuck out there, and we have no clue where we're going. If we head down this corridor and turn right and keep going to the end, we should reach it eventually, if we keep going straight, Glasses said. All right. I was hesitant to head out nearly blind into the halls, knowing that Gregory was still roaming around down here looking for us. But we had to move. I helped Ari up to her feet. Instead of carrying her now, I supported her with one arm seeing that she wanted to try walking herself. I wouldn't say that the plan we had was solid, but bar me transforming where I'd put them and other people in danger. It was the only solution we could come up with at the time. Before we made our move to exit the room, I checked around the shelves for something I could use as a weapon. My eyes fell on a metal pipe hanging halfway off one of the shelves. I grabbed it. 
It wasn't much, but I needed something in case we ran into trouble on the way over. Besides, I had a pretty mean swing when I was in Little League. I'm pretty sure it would still hold true to today. Glasses walked over to the door and placed her hand on the knob. With Aerie by my side, we started towards the door. Hey, this might be an awkward time to ask, but what's your name? I asked. It's Penelope, but you can just call me Penny. I like it better, Penny said with a smile. There are situations in which you look back and realize how foolish you were. When you don't realize things that are right in front of you. These moments where your guard is down. Moments where you don't notice the small details in time. Moments that you wish you were paying more attention. Moments that lead to catastrophe. The orange glow had returned, flowing in just barely through the crack beneath the door. But none of us had seen it immediately, and when I looked down, as my brain raced to recognize what it was seeing and comprehend what that meant, it was already too late. Penny was opening the door. The things that happened next happened quickly. Standing on the other side of the door was one of the molten students, waiting right outside. Penny tried to back up, but the student's movements, while jagged and robotic, were quick. It lunged at her, and as its hands contacted her chest, they melted into her flesh. Penny screamed an agonized cry. I rushed to help her as fast as I could, slamming the pipe into the student's head. It stumbled back a couple of feet away into the corridor. The student looked up at me and growled, melted flesh dripping down from its mouth. Go for the chest, you have to destroy the talisman, I heard Aerie yell. I looked down at the thing's chest. There was what seemed to be a small hole there, barely visible from beneath the scorched clothing. I pulled back and as the student charged towards me I swung as hard as I could. The blow landed dead center of the fiend's chest. The pipe careened through it like it was water. I watched as the talisman flew out of the student and shattered against the wall behind it. The student's body fell apart into a pile of smoldering ash and cinders in front of me. I turned back to see Aerie cradling Penny in her arms. Penny was gasping for air, her eyes filled with tears. Even though the student had only touched her for just a second, it had melted the skin and flesh a few inches into her chest, revealing her internal organs. After just a couple raspy breaths, Penny stopped breathing, her eyes staring lifelessly up at Aerie. Aerie's face was stricken with shock. I took a look down the corridor and saw orange lights approaching from around the corners. Aerie, Aerie, we need to go. I went over to her and grabbed her arm. She looked up at me and nodded. She wrapped her arm around my neck, and we started to hurry deeper into the corridor, away from the orange lights. Do you think some people are just born to become monstrous individuals? I'm sure there are a few people out there that are born fucked up, but that can't account for all of them. All that hatred, disgust, anger, it's all got to come from somewhere. As for me, I wouldn't call myself a saint or anything. Before all of this, I never thought I would be capable of killing anyone. I still can't bring myself to actually do it. In that way, you could say the wolf is a blessing. I can let it take over and lose myself in the darkness. Let it do all of the things I could never bring myself to do. It's easy to think of it as just some animal, a being that acts on survival instincts, uncontrollable and animalistic. But there is something else too, something much more sinister. It is the embodiment of all of my own dark desires, it doesn't act just out of survival, but out of compulsion. A compulsion for violence and bloodlust. It is not something that I want to rely on at all, but sometimes that cruelty is necessary. A time for no hesitation or remorse. I slammed my shoulder against a door at the end of the corridor, as Ari and I hurried away from the approaching students. They were rushing towards us, their eyes hellish infernos, their faces twisted into ghastly visages of pain the fire raging beneath their flesh rising towards a fever pitch, burning so brightly I thought they might explode any moment. As Aerie and I turned right and attempted to continue towards our destination, we came face to face with Gregory. Flames wreathed his body, illuminating the darkness with a pulsating orange glow. I'd thought the fire would be burning him, but he was unfazed by it. He looked at us, his tongue running along his lips. His body was so large that there was no way to get around him, his head scraping against the ceiling and his shoulders touching the walls. Slowly he started towards us, the flames rubbing off onto the surroundings with each step he took. 
turning around I realized with horror that we were surrounded on all sides. The one remaining path we had to go down was blocked by Leah, a trio of blazing orbs dancing around her body. This malevolent smile on her face. I barely had a second to think before seeing that one of the molten students was now nearly upon us, its hands reaching out towards Airy. I pushed her behind me and tried to raise the pipe. I was too slow. The student grabbed onto the metal and pushed me back. Spit shot out from its mouth, the droplets searing onto the flesh on my face. I noticed a flaming orb fly past my face, just barely missing me. Looking over at Leah, I saw her arm outstretched towards me. The other two orbs rocketed forward. In a panic, I reeled the molten student into their path. As the spheres entered its body, the creature roared in agony, its body pulsing and growing tumors spreading across its flesh. I kicked the student in the chest, my foot coming free of my shoe as it melted into his chest. I watched as the student writhed on the ground before melting into a pool of liquefied remains. The other molten student lunged for me, and I prepared to try and fend it off. Suddenly, I felt a hand grab me from behind as I was pulled back. Eri had opened the door I bumped into and yanked me inside. It was just in time, too, as I watched Gregory slam his fist down onto the other molten student, just before Eri shut the door. The room that door led to had a staircase, and at the top of it, I could see another door. I supported Eri again, and we climbed up the stairs, just barely reaching the top before Gregory came crashing in. We hurried through the door and found ourselves standing outside the administration building, in the middle of the campus. There wasn't any moment to enjoy the sunlight, as I could hear Gregory stomping his way up the steps. Airy and I started moving as fast as we could towards the gymnasium. On the way, I could see people walking around the campus like nothing was wrong. How was it possible that no one had noticed what was going on? Surely someone must have called 911. The school should have been evacuated at this point. Yet it wasn't. None of this made sense. In reality, it was all part of the curse, I just didn't realize it at the time. Part of the spectacle, you could say. The power of the demon goes beyond conventional thought, capable of manipulating not only people's bodies, but minds and very perception of the world around them. Even those who had no clue of its existence were subject to its whim. Yet this, I would come to find, would only be seeing the corona of its true capability. It was a being who viewed humans as cattle, living for the purpose of food and entertainment. It waited for decades for this event, and it expects to be satisfied. People looked at Ari and I, confused and alarmed, though this was only for a short while before they noticed Gregory charging after us. As I heard the sounds of people panicking behind me, I refused to look back. There was nothing I could do about it, or so I told myself. We burst through the doors of the gymnasium and found it thankfully empty. As we walked towards the men's locker room, I handed Penny's lighter to Airy. When we get in there, you should hide. I'll try and distract them, then you can trigger the sprinklers and get out, I said. Kevin, are you sure you want to do this? Airy asked. I shook my head. But I can't just leave after everything that has happened. It'll be fine, though. Just make sure I stay in there. I tried to push the thought of possibly getting killed from my mind. This was our best, our only shot at dealing with Gregory and Leah. I felt Airy grip onto me tighter, a look of worry on her face. As I pushed the locker room door open, I turned to see Gregory and Leah entering into the gym, the two of them catching sight of us. The locker room wasn't incredibly large, housing about four rows of lockers, with a couple benches and some lost clothes spread about. There was this large clothes hamper situated next to the door that Airy positioned herself behind to hide. It wasn't the best hiding spot, but it wasn't like there were many to choose from in the room. I hoped me distracting them would be enough for them to not take notice of her. I walked deeper into the locker room and leaned against the wall opposite the door. My hands were shaking uncontrollably my breath shallow and my heart beating out of my chest. I tried to calm myself down, but when I saw the door being pushed open, the fear gripped me like a vice. The first to enter was Gregory, fire still cloaking his body. When he saw me, his lips curled into a smile, and he charged at me. I swung the pipe at him. He caught it in one hand, wrapping the other entirely around my throat. 
He ripped the pipe from my hand and tossed it aside, lifting me up off of the ground. I struggled to breathe, feeling my throat being crushed between his fat fingers, the heat of the flames burning my face. You're not just a friend of Miranda's, huh? You know Aerie, too, I see. What is she to you? I wonder. I heard Leah's voice from behind Gregory. You got here without going past us, so it looks like Miranda helped you. I'll have to remember that when her turn comes up. W why I choked out as Gregory applied more and more pressure to my neck. Why? Leah asked. Gregory lightened his grasp on my neck, allowing me to speak. Why kill all of these people? The only person you need to go after is Ari, so why attack anyone else? Because they were in the way. Because it felt good. Because I'm doing the world a favor. There are numerous reasons I could give. You can take your pick of what you think it is. It would be a waste of time for me to justify myself to you. Why don't you just tell me where Ari is? Leah stepped around the side of Gregory, looking up at me with these emotionless green eyes. It was like her body was hollow, soulless. Leah was walking around and talking, but if there ever was a person residing in her body, they were long dead. You're gonna kill me either way, right? Leah nodded her head. It will be less painful if you tell me. Now out with it. Abruptly, water started shooting from the sprinklers. The fire that coated Gregory's body was snuffed out in a near instant. Leah's face contorted with confusion. I'm sorry, Leah, for everything. The past and what is about to happen. Eri was standing at the door to the locker room, holding it open. Leah began moving towards her, and Eri slammed the door shut. I watched Leah try to open the door, but it wouldn't budge. Sealed it. That won't hold very long. Gregory, finish up with him. Gregory opened his maw wide and tried to force my head inside of it. I could feel the heat from his fetid breath. As my head went inside his gaping mouth, I grabbed his top and bottom jaws, trying to keep them from clamping down on me. His teeth pierced into my hands as slowly I saw his mouth starting to close over me. I cried out in pain, blood pouring from my hands. It pooled in Gregory's mouth and streamed down his face. As his teeth began to pierce into the flesh of my head, that was when true fear finally gripped me. The fear that my life was going to end. Killed and consumed by some pigmen. I let out a yell, primordial and bestial, a cry of desperation. I wasn't going to die here, not in this place, not as this pig fucks lunch. The pressure on my head began to relieve as I pushed back against his mouth as hard as I possibly could. I could feel a couple of fingers on my hands be severed and rend off. The pain was excruciating, yet I kept struggling hard as I could. My muscles started to burn and I felt lacerations forming across my skin. The bones in my hands elongated, cracking and shifting under my flesh. My skin peeled away like a cocoon, revealing large obsidian claws. I dug my claws into the roof of Gregory's mouth and ripped them out, tearing out the top of his mouth and snout from his face. Gregory let out a horrendous squeal and threw me across the room. Impacting the wall, I collapsed into a puddle of water on the floor. Looking down, I saw my clothes ripping open as my body began growing. My body was racked with so much pain, it clouded my mind. I ripped away at the skin that was constricting me. I felt this intense pressure pushing its way out of my skull. I was possessed by the need to relieve it. Thus, I pushed my claws into my face and ripped away all of the flesh and skin. My vision began to shift and blur as the colors around me started to alter. The stench of death and decay that seeped from Gregory becoming much more pungent and distinct. This transformation was not like the first as my memory of the initial stages of it are mostly clear. Although it didn't feel like I was in control of my body, it was as if I was being compelled to take specific actions, like my body was being piloted by someone. The thoughts in my mind became harder and harder to keep track of, as this indescribable rage boiled up within me. A familiar after you said you would never take one, I heard Leah say. Just another one of your lies, right, Ari? I rose to my feet, seeing that Gregory was no longer towering over me. Blood poured down from the hole beneath what little of his snout remained. Seeing all of that red, it triggered something in me. This compulsion where I wanted nothing more than to rip and tear into him. I didn't give a shit about Eerie or Leah or anything else. 
Violence. That was the only thing on my mind. With an open claw, I charged at Gregory. The sudden attack caught him off guard. He tried to swing at me, but I quickly ducked, his blow finding nothing but air. I gouged into his chest, tearing down and pulling large chunks of flesh from his disgusting body. Blood and pus oozed from the wounds with whatever that black slime that flowed from his body was, all of it mixing into a foul concoction of bodily fluids. Gregory squealed loudly and attempted to grab me. I grabbed both of his arms, claws digging into them. The pain in my skull intensified, and the bone around my mouth jutted forward, forming a muzzle. With my new mouth, I opened wide and bit into Gregory's neck, tearing away at his veins and arteries. My mind was starting to fade more and more now, my memory becoming fragmented. Gregory continued to fight. For how long, I don't know. After this, there is only one clear moment I still remember. At some point, I was hunched over Gregory. He was on the ground. His body was ripped to pieces, innards on display, and in a pool of his own blood. His body was no longer transformed, instead reverted back to his human form. He was dead. I looked up from his body and saw Leah. She was leaning against the door looking directly at me, her eyes wide, lips trembling. She tried pulling the door open again, but it stayed shut. As I crawled towards her getting closer and closer, she started banging on the door. I could tell she was screaming something, but her voice was so distorted it was impossible to make out. My memory is lost right before I reach her, though. I woke up sometime during the night in Aerie's bed, with no clue as to how I got there. Aerie was sitting beside me in the bed, reading a book. Her arm was bandaged and she was out of her bloodied clothes. After I started shifting around a bit, she noticed I was awake. Hey. Aerie smiled and grasped my hand. Welcome back. I sat up and rubbed my eyes. I was wearing a t-shirt that was about a size too big, and boxers that were the same. I also seemed to have all my digits and felt fine, besides a slight headache. They're victors, sorry, but it's better than having you just be naked. That would be hard to explain when we were taking you back here. What happened, I asked. It's over, you came through for me. Ari leaned over and kissed me on the cheek. Leah and Gregory were both dead, killed by me even though I don't remember killing either of them. Ari refused to tell me the details of what I actually did. She doesn't want me to worry myself over it. The look she gets on her face when I ask, whatever I did must have terrified her. Miranda came in to check on me shortly after I woke up, wanting to see if there were any problems with stuff like my sight and reflexes, to check for any adverse side effects from the transformation. While Miranda was doing that, Ari hopped up, leaving the room to finish preparing dinner. Seems like everything is all right, Miranda said. Is there usually problems after transformations? I asked. No, not usually, but it doesn't hurt to check, especially given your circumstances. I wish I knew what I did, Ari won't tell me. I, I know I killed them, but I want to know how, I said. Miranda looked at me with a solemn expression. You know you killed two people. That is all you need to know. What would the knowledge of how do for you? Miranda said. What would it do for me? That was a good question. There wouldn't be any happiness for me knowing what I did to them. The fragmented memory I have is clue enough to how brutal it was. Still, not knowing filled me with this sense of apprehension. Even if it was horrible, I felt like I needed to know. I owe you one, by the way, Miranda said with a gentle smirk. I looked at her, confused. You saved Aerie. I know it was a huge risk. If you hadn't been there, well, I would have lost my best friend. Miranda wrapped her arms around my neck, hugging me tightly. Thank you, Kevin. You don't know how much she means to me. When Miranda pulled away, I noticed she had a couple tears running down her face. Wiping them onto her sleeve, she stood up. What do you say we head to the other room with the others? I got out of the bed and followed Miranda into the living space of the apartment, passing Ari, who was in the kitchen. Victor was sitting at this dining table they had set up in the corner of the area, feet resting on the tabletop. Hey bro, you're up. You know, you're a lot heavier than you look, Victor said. You carried me back here? I asked. Somebody had to. He replied. Aerie called me after it was done, and I brought Victor over, Miranda said. Be glad we both got there quick because you were about... Victor! Miranda interrupted him suddenly, this stern look on her face. 
What was I about to do, I asked. N nothing We were worried the seal wouldn't hold on the door, but it was fine, Miranda said. Something about her sudden change in tone made me think she wasn't entirely truthful with me. You're not telling me something. I'd appreciate not being lied to, I said. Miranda's eyes darted to the ground as she rubbed her temples. Damn it, Victor. Ari called us because she was worried you wouldn't be able to be contained. She... she was right. When we got there, you broke through the door. After Miranda said that, a pang of dread formed in the pit of my stomach. Did I hurt anybody? I asked. No, Victor and I got there in time to, um, subdue you, Miranda said. He did give me a pretty gnarly scrape, not gonna lie. Victor said, showing a gash running down his left forearm. But he's fine. Victor just likes to exaggerate things. I could understand they didn't want me to feel like I was putting other people in danger, especially Ari. But I began to wonder what would have happened had Miranda and Victor not shown up when they did. I would have probably ended up killing Ari along with her sister. It filled me with a sickening feeling. Dinner's ready, guys, Ari called out from the kitchen. Look, everything's fine. Let's just have a nice meal, yeah? You're hungry, right? Miranda asked. No, I'm not hungry, I answered. I'm not hungry. I hadn't eaten all day, and it was late into the evening now. Why wasn't I? That was strange, right? I should have been at least a little hungry. Ari, open the door, please. Leah's voice sounded in my head. Then I was hit with this sudden intense wave of nausea. I rushed into the bathroom and knelt down over the toilet puking. Looking down at what came out, I screamed in terror, slamming my back against the wall. Inside of the toilet bowl, floating in the water mixed with chewed flesh and crushed bone, was a perfectly intact green eye. What's wrong? Ari came running into the bathroom. I ate her! When it comes to the whole fight-or-flight instinct, I'm usually on the spectrum of flight. This is because I'm not a fighter by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a coward. A coward who can only fight when they've been trapped into doing so. Pretty much like a cornered animal. Which is what makes this whole ordeal a bit ironic that I'm involved. Even if there is the whole werewolf thing, I had no idea what the hell triggered it. Intense emotion. Life or death situations. Luck. Hell, I was about to get my head chomped down on when the guy finally decided to show up and bail me out. A second later and I'd have been just a hunk of meat and bone. There was no way I could relay on it. Still, there was part of me that knew the wolf was needed. That if I was going to make it through this hell, I would need to figure out what makes it tick. With that being said, I was just as afraid of the wolf as I was any of Ares' sisters, if not even more so. He and I have more of an understanding of each other now. There are times, however, that I feel if the wolf could, it would do away with me entirely. The realization that I had eaten Leah was horrific. I knew I had killed her, but the fact that I had gone so far as to consume her was something that disturbed me to a great degree. Just the thoughts that bits and pieces of her were still making their way through my digestive tract. It made me want to keep vomiting. So I tried to shoving my finger down my throat. I forced myself to regurgitate more of Leah into the maroon water of the toilet bowl. It took both Ari and Victor to grab me away from the bathroom and stop me from continuing to purge my systems. I was in shambles emotionally, bawling my eyes out. Even if Leah deserved to die for what she did, the mental strain from knowing that I ate, another human being was destroying me. I wasn't a fool. I knew that was a possibility. But to know I actually did it, nothing could have prepared me for that. Ari tried calming me down, but I wasn't in any mood for it. I stormed out of the apartment into the cold. I didn't give a shit. I was just wearing a thin t-shirt and boxers. I didn't even care. It was my bare feet walking across the snow-covered concrete of the sidewalk. I wanted to get away, away from all of this. All of this. Every facet of my situation began to crash into my mind. All of the violence, the murder, the terror, the cruelty, just the absurdity of it all. It forced me into a full-blown mental breakdown. I was walking through the streets with no particular destination in mind. The faces of concerned and bewildered people I walked by or looked out at me from their cars. I eventually found myself in the alleyway between some crummy diner and a run-down 24-hour laundromat. 
I collapsed to the ground and laid on my back, just staring up at the starless night sky. I threw my arm over my eyes and cried, letting out all of those emotions that had been building up since this entire situation started. All of the anger, frustration, fear, misery, hatred. I just couldn't hold it together anymore. I'm sure to anyone looking at me, I was a pathetic sight. Suddenly, I felt something lick my cheek. Moving my arm aside, I saw the culprit was this little beagle pup. He had no collar and his fur was a bit dirty. So I took him for a stray. I reached over and started scratching underneath the dog's chin. You feeling all right there? I heard a voice from behind me, deeper in the alleyway. I sat up and sniffled. Looking back, I saw a homeless man standing just a few feet away. The puppy crawled into my lap and propped itself against my chest, licking my chin. Sorry about him, he doesn't get to meet new people all that often, the man said, walking closer. What's his name? I asked, stroking the dog's back. Aster. He's been my companion for, oh, a while now. Someone stuffed him in a box and tossed him into a dumpster. He might have stayed in there had not heard his yipping. He might not talk much, but he keeps me good company. The man took off the outer coat he was wearing and offered it to me. Go on. It's a cold one tonight. I hesitantly took the coat from him and slid it on. It was a few sizes too big, so nothing too new to the clothes I had been getting. The man walked beside me and took a seat against the wall. Reaching into his pocket, he retrieved a cigarette and lighter. As I watched him light it, he chuckled. I know, it's a terrible habit, he said, taking a deep puff. Just can't bring myself to break it. We sat there together in silence for a few minutes before I felt I needed to ask him. Why'd you feel the need to come over to me? Aster here is the one who found you. He's a good judge of character. I could also see you were down on your luck. Looked like you could use some company. When I ran out here initially, that was what I wanted. Just to wallow in my tears without anyone around. Yet, sitting there in that alley with Aster and that man... There was this sense of comfort just having a neutral presence there. Just another person who was showing a bit of kindness. It made me not feel so isolated from the world. We sat in silence for a good while, the man never once asking me why I was there or what I had been crying about. Aster curled up in my lap and fell asleep, while the man was just sitting there, smoking his cigarette and sharing in the peace and quiet. Kevin. I heard Aerie's voice from the streets. She sounded pretty stressed out. She's looking for you, the man said. I know, I replied. You should go to her. It's a nice thing every now and then, taking a break from life like this. But you need to keep moving forward. Aster got up and stretched, hopping off of my lap and walking over to the man. I got up off the ground. I couldn't just run from this situation as much stress and pain that would save me. Thank you, uh, by the way, I said as I started walking down the alley towards the streets. Don't mention it. A shame things turned out like this. You're a good kid, Kevin. Take care of that part of yourself. Long as you do, you'll never truly be a monster. I stopped and turned around to be greeted by an empty alley. The only sign that the man had even been there. The coat I was wearing and the smoking butt of the cigarette he had. Kevin! I looked forward to see Aerie rushing down the alley towards me. She charged into me, causing us both to fall onto the ground. Aerie buried her head into my chest, sobbing loudly. All the time I had known her, I hadn't ever seen Aerie like this. She was usually calm and composed. Here she was, crying profusely, her face wrought with worry. <laughs> I'm sorry I was scared. I didn't want to hurt you. I, I should have told you. I just didn't want to risk losing you, Aerie said between her distraught sobs. I love you. I know it seems like I don't, but I do. Aerie's fingers gripped onto me tightly as her streaming tears darkened the fabric of the coat. She was shivering something fierce. She hadn't attempted to grab her jacket when she came out to look for me. But it wasn't the cold that caused Aerie to shake so. It was because she was terrified. I, I don't want to be alone. Please. I know it's selfish. I know what I did was horrible. I... I just didn't want to stop seeing you. Aerie looked up at me, her lips quivering, her eyes puffy from all of the crying. I wrapped my arms around her and held her close. I... I won't go anywhere. Just don't lie to me anymore. From now on, I want you to tell me everything, even if you think it will upset me. 
I said. I... I won't. Aerie said. We sat there together for a few moments before getting up and starting back towards the apartment. Aerie grasping onto my hand, her eyes still watery. Seeing this side of her, in a way, it calmed my nerves. Thoughts had started to creep in that she just using me for her own survival. I had tried to push them away, but these feelings she showed, they felt genuine. Our relationship isn't normal far from it. I don't think my feelings about her could ever change. Maybe that has to do with some magic she cast on me I'm unaware of. Or it could just be my hopeless romanticism. But as fucked up as the situation was, and as much as it scarred me physically, mentally, emotionally, I stayed. When we got back to the apartment, it was empty. Turns out that Miranda and Victor went out looking for me too, as well as Ari. Ari gave them a call to tell them we were back, and the two of us sat together on the couch. She leaned her head against my shoulder. I'm ready to talk, to tell you as much as I can. Ari went on to inform me about the multiple rules that the sisters are required to follow with the tradition. There were the ones I already knew about, and a few new ones. Things like there being a cool-down period of about three days after the death of one of the sisters, where the survivor would not be hunted by the next sister in line. Another being that the kills would only count when delivered by a sister or a familiar. There is also the rule of other sisters not being allowed to harm each other. The only ones that could were the current two youngest at the time. This rule in particular was bendable as I would soon come to find when I learned of the next sister in line to hunt Aerie down. This was because it wasn't one sister, it was a pair of twins. They were born joined together by one's left and the other's right arm. Their names were Riley and Fife. The two of them were just three years older than Aerie. Apparently, the two of them had distanced themselves from the family, like Leah did. Because of this, Ari had no idea where they were, nor what they would be capable of. Turns out, this was a common theme among most of the sisters. In fact, the only ones that still interacted with the family were Ari, Miranda, Jennifer the fourth oldest, and the sixth oldest Uriel. We were going to be in the dark, not knowing when they would eventually decide to show up or what their plan of attack was going to be. All we could do was wait, but we had some time that we could relax. Over the next few days, I ended up moving into the apartment. I mean, it just seemed like a smart decision to make. Not like my doormate was going to miss me much, the two of us hardly talked to each other. Granted, you could say our Ari and I's relationship was moving a bit fast, already hitting the living together point. I think we were well beyond that point though, personally. I found myself more and more turned off from eating anything that didn't include meat. I was also finding that I really wanted my meat rare, very rare. Speaking with Ari, she told me that appetite and diet changes were also a part of becoming a familiar. In case you are wondering, I was also safe from getting sick from consuming stuff like raw meat, a big plus not having to worry about salmonella or anything like that. On the downside, it made me hate foods that I used to love. I can't even eat ice cream anymore without some rather gruesome visits to the toilet. Things were normal for a couple of days. I ended up getting to know Miranda and Victor a bit better. Though what their intentions were, I couldn't and still can't pin down. I ended up agreeing to help Victor out on some volunteer work he did. The guy didn't really look it, but he was pretty active. Aside from his job working as a mechanic, the guy would volunteer down at this local animal shelter going out and rescuing strays, and also caring for them. He just sorta of asked me if I could help him one day and I agreed. I was never very good at turning people down when they asked me so directly for assistance. So I rode with him around the city as we tracked down some abandoned dogs and cats. Seeing that guy I pinned as just a stoner caring so much for these stray animals filled me with a strange feeling. Just not what I expected from him. As judgmental as that may seem. Personally, I wasn't all that much help to him. I wasn't nearly as good at coaxing these scared animals from their hiding places as he was. Guess that comes with all the experience he had, but watching him interact with them, I couldn't help but feel something was a bit off. The guy didn't even need food, and the animals would just come straight to him. Dude was just a natural animal whisperer. 
After we rounded up a good few animals, we headed back to the shelter, and I helped with the process of cleaning the animals up, treating any injuries they had, and feeding them. Oh, and of course, giving lots of pets and attention. It was a pretty relaxing, enjoyable time, and after all of the shit I'd been going through, it was very welcome. After we finished, Victor and I headed out to a bar for some drinks. I was never usually one for alcohol, but I was okay drinking on occasion. Inside old school rock filled the air, coming from a jukebox at the back of the room. We took our seats at the bar and ordered a couple of beers. Apparently, Victor was a regular here. The bartender slid us glasses filled to the brim with a dark brown brew. Hey man, I've meant to talk to you about something, Victor said, taking a swig. What would that be, I replied. It's about, you know, the whole turning into a monster thing. To be honest with you, I've wanted to avoid it, knowing we're going to eventually duke it out. Miranda wants me to help you out, though, to teach you how to control yourself. I'm not only doing it because she asked me to, you actually remind me a bit of myself after I first turned into a familiar. Victor leaned back in his chair, swirling around the beer in his glass. Why is that you turn into a wolf that slaughtered a bunch of cattle and almost kill your girlfriend? Close, see when I first turn Ed, I couldn't control myself either. Luckily, we were out in the middle of the woods, so there wasn't any risk of putting anyone in danger. Well, except for Miranda. Victor took another sip. When I turned, I just went into a rage, just knocking over trees and making a huge mess. Miranda didn't try to confront me, she just watched from a distance. She let me tire myself out. I find it ironic that someone as chilled out as you would turn into a raging bull, I said with a laugh. That's the thing, bro, that thing we turn into, e, it isn't us. More like the opposite. It's what we're not. What do you mean, I asked. Think about yourself. Do you have anything in common with the wolf? Victor asked. I had never really thought about it that way. I lived my life in an organized way, going to college because it's what I was told to do trying to please other people. I hardly did anything because I personally wanted to do it. The wolf felt like it did nothing but indulge in its own desires. Its existence was wild, free, untamed. It reminded me of how I was when I was a child. Of course, I didn't attack or eat people as a kid, but I lived life for myself carefree. It wasn't like I shared nothing in common with the wolf now. The anger it felt, the fear when we were about to die, it didn't want to die just as much as I didn't. Self-preservation, I responded. Of course, see, you've got to learn to find some common ground with it. Before that, you need to accept what you've become. I can see it in your eyes. You're still afraid of it. You still try to push it away, Victor said. You act like it would be easy for me to just come to terms with it. Easy? Hell no. I know how difficult it is, but you need it. You can't keep living in fear of it. It was easier said than done. The transformation was far more horrific than I cared to think about. Even getting past all of the pain, it just felt as if my own mind was being torn asunder, and my thoughts were not my own. Whatever I became, it wasn't me. Filled with so much bloodlust and want to murder, how could I be expected to come to terms with something like that, let alone control it? I could never do that, I muttered into my drink. Victor finished off his beer and sighed. Never, huh? He took out his wallet and paid for our drinks before heading to the door. Well, come on, we should be heading back. I downed the rest of my drink and followed Victor out to his truck. As we were driving, I noticed that we were not, in fact, heading back to the apartment. Instead, Victor was taking the roads that would lead us out of the city. Where are we going? I asked, confused. Where we need to go, man, where we need to go. I want to let you know I'm trying to help you out, bro. No matter what happens, just remember that. Victor took out his cell phone and made a call. Yep, heading for the cabin. It has been a while, hasn't it? All right, I'll see you soon. Victor hung up and tossed his phone into the cup holder. The truck was winding through the many bends and curves of the road that led into the hilly forests behind the city the headlights being the only illumination against the seemingly encroaching darkness. Who was that? I asked. Miranda. This was her idea anyway. Her idea? 
My question went unanswered as if Victor was just tuning me out. Victor made a turn, and we went off the pavement and onto a gravel road. The only thing I could make out in the surrounding darkness was the silhouettes of dead trees plastered against the backdrop of the night sky. A sense of anxiety was welling up inside of me. Victor was planning something, but short of jumping out of the truck into the woods, I was stuck with him. The drive continued until finally we entered into a tiny clearing. There was a cabin sitting in the middle of the clearing, decrypt, falling to pieces by the looks of it. Broken out windows and holes torn through the wooden walls. It was far from what I would consider a cozy place. Standing just in front of the cabin, I saw Miranda. Her back was to us as we came to a stop just a few feet behind her. When she turned around, and her eyes met mine, I could immediately tell something was off. Her eyes were these pools of oily black. The more I stared at her, I found myself unable to look away, as if those eyes were pulling me into her. I tried to turn my head, but my body refused to listen to me. The world around me began to pulse as my vision became wavy. Everything around Miranda turning out of focus and indistinguishable. No, even her face began to blur and melt away, the only thing left being those eyes that were attempting to drag out my very soul. I started to panic and want to yell for her to stop. It felt like my body was a prison, and each movement like I was trying to rip my bones through my flesh just to be able to look away. Then it went dark. I thought for a moment I might have passed out, but I was fully awake. The headlights of the truck had turned off, and Miranda was no longer standing in front of the vehicle. I looked to my left to see that Victor, too, was gone. I reached to take out my phone and call Iri. It wasn't in my pocket. I looked down at the cup holder for Victor's gone. Needless to say, the keys were nowhere to be seen either. I was stuck out here. I exited the truck and called out to Miranda and Victor. There was no response. What the hell were they planning? This wasn't something I expected them to do. Why would they bring me out here? My thoughts began to run wild in search of some way to make sense of the situation. That's when I looked into the back of the truck. Wasn't much back there save for a few miscellaneous things. Then I noticed something else back there. They were Victor's clothing. I recognized it as what he had been wearing all day. I checked the pockets of his pants and jacket, but I didn't find anything useful. If the moon hadn't been out in full that night, I probably wouldn't have been able to see anything. It was bright enough, though, that I could make out my surroundings decently. In front of the cabin, I came across a gruesome discovery. There were bits of skin and flesh just littering the area. They formed a sort of trail as I followed them along the side of the cabin. It was as if my curiosity had possessed me. The trail ended with a mound of flesh at the back of the cabin. Looking out into the forest, I saw something standing in front of the trees, just at the edge of the clearing. It was massive, this towering behemoth of a creature. Its head shaped like that of a bull's, with two giant horns that jutted from its skull. It stood bipedal, with arms and legs that were thick as tree trunks. Even after seeing Gregory to think that there was something like this, in comparison, it dwarfed him in size. It stared back at me with these sinister yellow eyes that seemed to glow from the darkness. I staggered backward, this sense of terror growing inside of me. Then I felt someone grasp onto my shoulders and heard Miranda's voice. My sister told you about the rules. True, I can't hurt her until my turn comes up. But Miranda turned me around, and I could see her face. It was nightmarish. Her usual joyful and excited features had been wholly replaced. Her face was pale, her veins and arteries clearly visible, almost bulging from beneath her skin. Her teeth were sharpened and jagged, this thick black saliva running over her lips. And those eyes, those black pits that filled me with dread. A familiar they don't get the same protection. Miranda placed her finger against the side of my forehead. You have such an adorable face. No wonder my sister fell for you. I think I'd like to have it, if you don't mind. Miranda dug her index finger beneath my skin and started to flay my face from my flesh. The pain was intense as she slowly drew her finger down. I could feel her finger just underneath the surface, digging deeper and deeper. I screamed out in agony, trying to raise my arms and push her away. But looking at those eyes, I was paralyzed. 
Her other index finger then dug into the other side of my face, wriggling beneath the flesh to get a good grip before pulling down slow and steady. I could feel the blood pouring down the sides of my face, falling onto my clothes. I shut my eyes and forcing myself as hard as I could to move, I pushed Miranda away and stumbled onto the ground. Her fingers tore out from underneath my flesh. I could feel the skin on the sides of my face fluttering as the wind blew by. She was actually trying to skin me alive. It was horrifying. This person couldn't have been the same Miranda as I had known. The woman who claimed to care about her sister so much. There was no way she could have been this monster standing before me now. I wasn't finished yet, Miranda yelled, her voice enraged. Now come back here and let me have that pretty face. Miranda started to briskly walk towards me. I staggered to my feet and began sprinting for the woods. As I did, I heard Miranda cackling behind me. You can run, Kevin, but we will find you, she yelled after me. You know, nowadays, I can really relate to the phrase, live every day as your last. I mean, that's pretty much my existence at the moment. A lot of not knowing just when I'm gonna die. An extension of that is not knowing if I'm gonna have to end up killing someone myself. I do my best to lie to myself and convince myself things are normal and okay. If I couldn't do that, well, I don't know what I'd do. Sprinting into the trees, the branches reached out like fingers tearing at my clothes, the cold air cutting into my lungs like a razor with every short breath. I didn't even see the sudden decline in the terrain, finding myself tripping and rolling down to the bottom of this ravine, coming to a stop when I impacted against the trunk of a tree. The blunt force must have cracked a couple of ribs if they weren't outright broken. Heaving myself up off of the ground, I stood up and looked around. I was back in front of the cabin. I felt a pair of arms drape themselves around my neck and heard Miranda's voice behind me. You're stuck here, all alone, no one to help you. Miranda gently stroked my cheek with the back of her fingers. I wonder if she'll cry for you. I wrenched myself free from Miranda's grasp only to turn around and be greeted by that massive bipedal bull. His arm shot out, and I felt his hand wrap around my neck, lifting me up into the air. He looked up at me, this impassive stare. His grip tightened and I strained to breathe, feeling my windpipe collapsing. What are you waiting for? The voice that came out of the bull belonged to Victor, much gruffer and more bestial. Of course, it was him. He reeled back his free hand, and slammed his fist into my stomach, letting me then collapse onto the ground. I got to my hands and knees, coughing, blood pouring out from my mouth. The punch felt like it had ripped my internal organs to shreds. A hand gripped onto the back of my neck and yanked me to my feet. I looked up to see Miranda holding onto me. Why are you doing this? I choked out. I thought I'd get in some practice, and you were an easy target. You wouldn't have lasted much longer anyway. You got lucky with Leah. Luck would never cut it with the others, Miranda said. But, but if you kill me, what about Aerie? I thought you wanted to protect her. I yelled. And you would do that, a useless familiar like you? I hate to tell you this, but... Miranda leaned in closer to my face. She can just find someone else. I'm sure she has a few other potential familiars in my mind. You were just the most convenient. No, that isn't true, I muttered. I don't blame her, she got cold feet on the night of her birthday. Airy had to know Leah would be chomping at the bit for a chance to murder her. Her fear got the best of her, so she just shacked up with the nearest idiot who loved her. It just so happened to be you. I refused to believe Miranda's words. There was no way that could be the type of person Airy was. That wasn't the person I knew. Then again, who really was the eerie that I knew? Could it be possible she was leading me on for just this situation? I see the doubt in you. She's probably told you all manner of rules and stipulations. I doubt you'd question any of them. Probably take her at her word. Men like you are always so gullible. So easy to manipulate. Shut up! I shouted. I didn't want to hear any more of it. Miranda's words wormed their way into my mind. Eating away at my thought and filling me with suspicion. They were wrong. They had to be wrong. That's impossible. Pathetic. She has sex with you once and you just blindly trust her. What a miserable little shit you are. On second thought, you can keep your face. Looking at it now, it disgusts me. 
Miranda's expression shifted with revulsion. How about instead I just have Victor crush every bone in your body one at a time? Seeing that face twist in agony should make it cuter. Fuck. You. I spit the blood in my mouth onto Miranda's face. As it dripped down her cheeks, she wiped it off and laughed. Is that him? Miranda asked. I heard this low-pitched growl coming from behind me. Turning my head, I saw a huge black wolf, its teeth bared with saliva dripping out from its mouth. The wolf's eyes pulsated with a red gleam. Looking into its eyes, I began to feel a wave of intense anger. Miranda let go of me and began taking some steps back. The wolf walked forward, getting closer and closer to me. There was something in its stare, almost like it was beckoning to me, promising me that it could take away all of my frustrations, my inhibitions, my doubts. It was my true nature given form. It understood me, all of the anger, hate, frustration, everything I could never openly display, worrying about my image to other people, worrying about their feelings, even at my own detriment. It was reasonable to want to vent those emotions, wasn't it? The wolf spoke to me without words. Just by looking into its eyes, I could hear its voice. It assured me that I was the only person that mattered, that truly mattered in this world. I shouldn't have to live in fear of other people or live my life for someone else. People were only there to cause trouble. None of them could ever truly understand me. I had already done enough for them. It was time I lived for myself, time for me to be free. The closer it got, the more and more my feelings of anger and hate grew. I began to believe it. I thought that I deserved to live unshackled by other people's standards. I was the only one who mattered. It was me and me alone. I reached out to the wolf, my hand brushing across its fur. Slowly, my hand sank into the creature. I felt myself being pulled inside of it. I gladly gave myself over to the beast, allowing myself to become fully immersed in the wolf. I found myself in total and utter darkness, just floating in an abyss. I could feel nothing, hear nothing, see nothing. And though I found myself enveloped by this nothingness, I was filled with a sense of calm. I felt as if this was the way things were meant to be. No worries, no anxiety, just calm. Soon the dark gave way, and I found myself running across an open field. The moon was high up in the sky. I soared across the grass with such grace and speed, it felt so liberating. I took notice of a few cows grazing in the field. I could feel my stomach aching as I was hit with a pang of sudden hunger. Without a second thought, I pounced onto one of the cows and sank my fangs into its neck, gouging at its flank with my claws. I made quite a mess in my attempt to feast. It was exhilarating, the taste of fresh meat on my tongue and the feeling of flesh dripping from my claws. I howled at the moon, feeling free. As I tore deeper into my prey, I heard something approach. It could be that they were here to take my prey, take what was mine. Something I wouldn't allow. I looked up to see a girl approaching. She was trembling and afraid. Her aroma was intoxicatingly sweet. Nothing like the cow. No, this was something much more delicious. I bared my teeth and growled at the girl. I thought she would try to run. Instead, she decided to say something to me. Kevin, it's me. I'm not gonna hurt you. The girl sounded terrified as she spoke. Kevin, who was that? I didn't care. The only thing that mattered to me was tasting what flavor could be behind that sweet stench. I charged at the girl and tackled her to the ground. I tried to bite down on her neck, but she threw her arm in front of it. My fangs punctured into her arm, and the girl screamed in pain. The sickly sweet taste of her blood filled my mouth. It was far more delectable than I could have ever imagined. I tore away the chunks of flesh from her arm, swallowing them whole. I wanted more. I needed more. I dug one my claws into the girl's stomach, scraping a deep gash along with it and up her chest. I ran my tongue up the wound, savoring her flavor. Kevin, stop! The girl cried out useless words. Who would care what their prey had to say? Suddenly I felt a blunt force impact my chest, sending me stumbling backward off of the girl. I rose up to my feet, anger filling my veins. To think that my prey would fight back. The girl staggered to her feet her hand glowing with this faint purple light. Blood streamed down her arm, the skin and flesh hanging raggedly from it. 
her jacket and shirt both cleaved in twain, revealing the large wound that ran up her stomach. Please, stop this. The girl said, her voice weak. I charged at her again, claw ready to swipe this time for a killing blow. The purple glow in the girl's hand brightened, and another blunt force slammed into my chest. I let out a yowl as the impact sent me careening back across the ground. God damn it, Kevin, it's me, Aerie. I found myself dragged back into the abyss of darkness. It was a memory, one I did not remember making. Aerie, why was that name familiar? Did I know an Aerie? Aerie, that's right. I attacked her. I felt so bad for doing it. The injuries. That was how I gave them to her. How could I have forgotten who she was? Wait, how could I have forgotten who I was? I was Kevin. The wolf. The wolf promised me a life of being wild and carefree. There was no place for emotions like guilt or love. It would take away all of my memories and just allow me to live in the moment, without regret, without fear, without hesitation. I existed to indulge in my own desires. That was its strength. I was wrong about the wolf. While it was a part of me, it was not me. It wasn't my true self. It was just the part of me that I always pushed down. When I became a familiar, I guess that part of me got personified as this beast, becoming its own entity, and I gave myself wholly over to it. I was wrong to live in fear of it, but allowing it full control was worse. It left me here with nothing but memories and thoughts. I couldn't help but feel fear over what it was doing now that it had free reign. Would I be stuck in this limbo for eternity? No, I wouldn't. I couldn't let that happen. There had to be a way to take back control. It was at that point I remembered what Victor had said about finding common ground with the wolf. I needed to accept it, that no matter what I would do, the wolf was a part of me. You realize it now? Miranda's voice entered my mind. The wolf was always there. That part of yourself you refused to acknowledge. Right. I always cared so much about what other people thought of me. Always running away from my fears or pushing down my negative emotions. I hadn't thought that doing that would have formed something like that. They did always say it was unhealthy to bottle up your emotions. Can't say this is necessarily what they meant by it. This was your plan, huh? It was the only way for you to truly understand what you became, Miranda said. Do you know what you need to do? It's time I lived life more for myself. You were right. If I want to help Aerie, I can't keep being such a coward. I don't know if I'll be able to do it, but I at least have to try, right? I felt ground beneath my feet. Looking ahead, the wolf was snarling at me, a burning hatred expelling from its eyes as it stared at me. It didn't trust me. It didn't want to give up control. I could feel anxiety creeping in as I started to approach the wolf. As I got closer, it barked and took a step back. It was afraid, frightened that I might leave it forsaken in this dark place. It had been stuck here alone for so long. It refused to allow itself to be driven down again. Once I was only a couple of steps from it, the wolf began to whimper and bent down, the hatred in those red eyes becoming replaced with despair. I reached out to the wolf and it sank its teeth into my hand. I winced from the pain, but didn't try and pull my hand away. I brought my other hand and stroked the wolf's cheek. It'll be okay, just give me a shot, eh? I said. The wolf let go of my hand and looked up at me. It still didn't trust me, but I could see that it was willing to give me a chance. Abruptly, the darkness around me peeled away and I was forced back into reality. I found myself staring down at my body. It was completely transformed. Black fur covering my body, my hands these dark claws dripping with blood. I looked up to see Victor in his transformed state. His body was covered with gashes and bite marks. He was in a defensive posture, but as I looked at him, he started to let his guard down. Took you long enough. I don't know how much longer I'd have kept that up before really socking you one. Victor said, falling back onto his butt and breathing a sigh of relief. While I felt in control of myself, I didn't feel normal. This wasn't entirely because of the werewolf body, that fury and bloodlust that I remembered during my transformation against Gregory. It was still there I felt the urge to attack Victor, but I was able to fight against it. Seemed to be struggling over there, want to leave it? I heard Victor ask. <laughs> hmm. 
I tried to talk, but my voice wouldn't come out. Ah, bro, yeah, talking's tough. Just relax, clear your head, bro. Like you're meditating. Find a happy place. I watched as Victor shut his eyes. His horns fell off of his head, and his body began shrinking and reverting back to normal. In just a few moments, he was back in his human form. See easy, he said. Clear my mind. All I could think about was trying to rip him apart and have myself a good meal. What a horrible thought to have, I didn't want to eat another person. I shut my eyes and started to try and clear my head. It was easier said than done, but I managed to find a sense of peace. When I next opened my eyes, I was standing naked, surrounded by black fur. Good job, you did it, I heard Miranda yell as she ran over towards Victor and I. Her features were a far cry from the monster I remembered seeing her as earlier. She was carrying these two plastic bags with her. Oh, I hope I didn't scare you too much. You had me worried for a little while there. Hey, you weren't the one he was trying to kill, Victor said. I was worried about you, you big dope. Miranda chucked one of the bags at Victor, nailing him in the side of the head with it. Both of you honestly, E would kill me if this plan ended in you becoming a permanent werewolf. Miranda held out the other bag to me. Permanent? I asked, taking the bag from her. Inside of it was all of my clothes. Well, that's part of the risk when doing this. I didn't think that would happen, though. I had a lot of faith in you, Kevin. You just strike me as one of those protagonist types, you know? I was sure you'd get through it fine. Was there a plan B for if it didn't work? Miranda looked at me and frowned. I'd rather not talk about that. Besides, it worked. We should be happy. Right, so what exactly did you do to me, Em? I asked, getting myself clothed. Miranda held up her hand and a green glow pulsated off of it. Her eyes transformed again into those dark black pits. Part of my power, I can get into people's heads. I used it to help you confront the wolf inside you without putting you in any physical danger. The glow went away from Miranda's hand and her eye returned to normal. Then why was Victor messed up? See, when you let the wolf take over, you let it take full control of your body and it sort of just rampaged around. So that's why Victor needed to be around to keep your body in check while you figured stuff out inside. Since the wolf is driven by pure instinct and emotion, I can't do much to hold it back. Which is why I'm here, bro. I can handle a beating. Plus, I thought of it as a nice little sparring session. Victor said, walking over and zipping up his jacket. I noticed there was a scratch running down his cheek. I didn't remember him having... You're still hurt, I said. Yeah, that can happen if you sustain too much damage. Can't heal it all. It's no big deal. Be good as new soon enough, Victor said. So what? I can control the transformation now. When I said that, Victor started to laugh. Probably not, Miranda mumbled. This was a good first step, but it'll take practice, so you still need to be careful when it comes to letting that wolf out. I had a feeling it wasn't just going to be that simple. Still, it was eye-opening to be able to confront that side of myself. At that time, I didn't realize just how hard it was going to be to maintain my sense of self when the time came for me to call upon the wolf. That was when I could even figure out how to trigger it in the first place. There were still a lot of things that eluded me about the transformation at that point. That night, Miranda decided to drag all of us to IHOP one of the few places open to go eat this late at night. Partially for a celebration, and partly because Miranda needed to explain what happened to Airy, and it was one of Airy's favorite places to eat. Airy wasn't ecstatic about Miranda's plan, but understood Miranda's reasoning for doing it. Riley and Fife were already probably planning on how to go about their attempt on Airy's life. It wasn't going to be a matter of if I need to use the wolf, but when. The way Miranda saw it, the risk was worth it. She was right. Without it, I don't stand much of a chance of surviving, and by extension, wouldn't be of much help to Aerie. After we finished eating, I decided to head outside and get some fresh air and have some time alone. I leaned against the side of the building and watched my breath waft through the air. Something caught my eye across the street. Sitting on the other side of the road was him, my wolf. He was staring at me, solemn, letting me know that he was here, waiting for when I uphold my side of the deal. A thought had been present in my mind as the days went by after learning of Ares' powers. What if something like that was used for personal gain? 
Neither Aerie nor Miranda ever uses their powers on people unless they feel they have to. I had already seen with Leah the amount of destruction they could be capable of. Leah only sought to kill people, but what if instead their powers were used to manipulate? It wouldn't take me long to find out that this was just what some of the other sisters had in mind. After that first little session I had with Miranda and Victor to learn a bit more about my familiar side, it was decided that I would meet with them three times a week at that old cabin. To keep practicing my control over my familiar side, as well as turn them into training sessions, Eri would tag along as well, not wanting the training to be happening behind her back. It really wasn't easy to figure out how to control the wolf. Even now, it's a bit of a crapshoot for me to call on it reliably. That first couple of sessions were a roller coaster. I'd try to force out some negative emotions, call on it like it was a pet, had Victor rough me up a bit. That furry little shit was just chilling out. It wasn't until I was getting genuinely frustrated with it that finally, I was able to make some headway. I mean, I was standing stark naked in the middle of the wilderness in the freezing cold. That shit really fucking grates on you, especially with other people there. It was more than a little embarrassing. Even then, the transformation didn't fully complete. Instead, sort of just getting to the halfway point and suddenly reverting. Thus, we shifted focus to something else that was easier to achieve. It turns out that familiars can call upon some of their transformation's physical capabilities when just in their human form. For instance, in Victor's case, he was able to lift a good few hundred pounds of shit with ease in his human form. Nothing like what that hulking minotaur form he had could do, but it was still pretty incredible. I just needed to figure out what trait it would be for me. It didn't take me too long to figure out that it was the wolf's agility. I was able to run pretty quick and jump a bit further than I usually did. Didn't inherit any extra stamina though so I was exhausted after just a short bit of exercise. I wondered how the fuck Victor never seemed to break a sweat doing all this stuff. Turns out that the guy really isn't a fucking burnout at all. He just likes to smoke a shit ton of ganja. That and just has a really chilled out personality. This guy, I shit you not, was an expert in Muay Thai kickboxing and pretty adept at regular boxing. At one point, he even had a professional career in boxing before meeting Miranda. He gave it up after falling in love with her and becoming her familiar. He thought it would be unfair for him to keep fighting, since he wasn't entirely human anymore. Bro, your endurance sucks, Victor said as I laid collapsed on the ground, breathing so hard I thought I was going to faint. I tried to retort, but the best I could manage was some incomprehensible words and a couple of vague hand motions. Gonna need to work on that he said, holding out a hand to me. I grabbed it, and he helped me to my feet. Seeing as I had no clue about even the first thing of self-defense, I came to ask Victor to basically become my coach and teach me his ways, as it were. Way I looked at it if I was going to be inevitably fighting monsters who wanted nothing more than to turn my insides to outsides, I should know how to fight. Even if just a little. So these trips out to the cabin became training regiments, the first few days really only resulting in me nearly dying from exhaustion, covered in bruises, and generally upset. A pretty productive set of days. As the next week rolled around, I still had to make sure I was on top of my university studies as well. My life might have been in danger, but on the off chance I lived, I did still want to graduate. I would rather not have wasted the years of my life I already spent there. And in the midst of all of this, Ari and I tried to be a normal couple and do normal couple stuff. Although I was never really good at deciding where to go on dates, so I kinda left that up to her most of the time. For a short while, things were nice. I was actually enjoying life, something that I thought would have been impossible after this whole thing began. The feeling didn't last very long before the reality of our situation started creeping back in. A couple of days into the week, another one of Ari's sisters, Jennifer, decided to call and schedule a meetup with her. Jennifer was an interesting case. She worked as a detective for the city's police department. She was one of the sisters who still did keep relatively consistent contact with the family. And according to Ari, she was just as trustworthy as Miranda. 
Jennifer had some information that she felt she needed to discuss with Ari, and by extension, me. We ended up meeting at this quaint little diner on the south end of the city. Place looked like it had been made in the 60s, and they just never decided to modernize. The food there was pretty decent, from what little of it I managed to eat. On the way over to the diner, I couldn't help but feel there was something off. Like I would be looking out the window, I could have sworn that I would see some cars that seemed to be following us. Right when I would start to take notice of them, they would make a turn or pull over somewhere. I tried not to think much of it, it was probably just me being paranoid. Because of that thought, I didn't end up telling Ari. It wouldn't have been good to worry her over what was probably nothing. When we entered the diner, I noticed a woman sitting at a table towards the back the building raised her arm and motioned to us. That's her, I heard Ari say. We went over to the woman, and she got up and gave Ari a tight hug. How have you been? I know it can't be easy, Jennifer said, pulling back from Ari. I've been okay. No use in worrying about it all so much, right? Jennifer took a look over at me and smiled. You must be Kevin. I'm Jennifer. Aries told me a little about you. Only good things, mind you. Don't worry. How about you two take a seat? We sat down and a short while after ordering our food and a bit of small talk, Jennifer started to get into why she wanted to meet us. You've been paying attention to the local news, right? All of the stories about the disappearances? Jennifer asked. This had been something that was going on in the town for the past couple of months. People, mostly those aged between 16 and 24, would suddenly just vanish. At first, because of the younger age of some of the individuals, it was assumed they could have been runaways. This sentiment quickly changed as the disappearances started mounting higher and higher. It wasn't just troubled persons who ended up vanishing either. Some of them were pretty stable, honest people. A person who would show up to work or class every day, suddenly just stopping and not responding to any attempts at contact. A common thread amongst the missing persons. This month, the number of disappearances jumped quite a bit, going from just a handful of people a week to dozens, if not more. I even knew a couple of people who this happened to. It became pretty clear that these people were not just vanishing, they were being kidnapped by someone for whatever purpose was anyone's guess. I heard about that. It led to a curfew being put in place across the city, right? Ari said. Yeah, the chief went about implementing that because he thought it might curb the number of disappearances. The problem is they have only seemed to ramp up. People are just being taken in broad daylight. We have gotten some reports that a few people have seen the abductions taking place. To make matters worse, when confronted, the perpetrators will get violent, Jennifer said. Violent? I asked. We had an incident this past weekend where a father was witnessing his teenage daughter being dragged into a van just outside their house. He went out to try and help her, but he was unable to stop them. The perpetrators, two men and a woman, savagely beat and maimed the father until he died using a variety of implements. A baseball bat, crowbar, one even used a woodcutter's axe. All of this in front of onlookers. By the time they were done, the father's body was maimed well beyond recognition. He had multiple limbs dismembered and his skull just mush on the pavement. Jennifer continued. Did no one try to help them? Erie asked. A few witnesses called the police and one man exited his house with a shotgun to try and aid the father. The man managed to shoot and kill one of the men, but was then immediately rushed by the other two attackers and also murdered facing the same violent death as the father. One of the perpetrators, the woman, took his shotgun and started to fire indiscriminately at anyone else nearby. She struck one woman who had to be taken to the hospital. The perpetrators then left the scene with the teenage girl. By the time the police arrived, they were long gone, Jennifer explained. What the fuck, that sounds horrible, I muttered. That kind of thing has been happening all across the city. There is something even more disturbing about the suspects in these murders and kidnappings. Jennifer stopped talking when the waitress came back to our table with our food. After we got our plates and the waitress left, Jennifer continued. Some of them appear to be people who were previously abducted. So you're saying that these people who get kidnapped are now also doing the kidnapping? Why the hell would they be doing that? I asked. 
confused. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? The answer to that question is actually quite simple, and it all revolves around this. Jennifer reached into her pocket and pulled out a small, clear plastic bag. Inside of the bag was this dark red gel pill. How about you take a close look at it, Ari? I think you'll notice something. Ari took the bag from Jennifer and held it in her palm. At first, she seemed confused. Then she seemed to become afraid. That... that can't be right, I heard her say under her breath. What is it? I asked. It's faint. But there's magic in here, Ari said. You mean like your magic, you know, witch magic? Is it another of your sisters? I said. While there might exist other people who can use magic, I never met any. The only ones I know of are in our family, which limits down the suspects that could have made that pill, Jennifer stated. You might be wondering what's in that pill. Well, the test came back saying it was blood, solidified into that gel state you see there, although there were trace amounts of other ingredients. You remember who in our family specialized in blood magic, don't you? Riley and Fife, Ari answered. The two sisters who just so happened to be next on the list to hunt us down. What a happy coincidence this turned out to be. Jennifer nodded. That pill is a drug referred to as tiger's blood. It's a narcotic that has appeared on the streets from out of seemingly nowhere just a couple of months back, when people first started disappearing. The effects of the drug cause the user's senses to intensify. Things feel better, taste better, smell better. On top of that, it rewires a person's brain to interpret pain as pleasure. This has led to reports of some users taking multiple gunshots without flinching. It also can cause intense mood swings and violent tendencies. Jennifer took a sip of her coffee. It also has extreme addictive capabilities. After taking it just once, a person will get hooked and enter a state of withdrawal just 24 hours after taking the pill. This withdrawal state will lead people to become severely irrational and willing to do anything to get back that high. Are you saying that all of the suspects behind these abductions, they are on this drug? Ari asked. All of them? I can't say that for sure. All of the eyewitness reports and testimonies show evidence that the majority of the people were under the influence of Tiger's blood during the abductions. See? After taking the drug, the user's eyes will become bloodshot and the sclera, that little white part around your pupil, it will turn a light red, darkening as you take more of the drug. I had known this city had a drug problem for a while, but I didn't think it was anything like this. This is the sort of shit you would get in a movie, a substance some supervillain would come up with, not something you would have to deal with in the real world. Ari handed the bag with the pill in it back to Jennifer, who stuffed it back into her pocket. Throughout this whole conversation, neither of us had touched our food, and the more we talked, the less of an appetite I had. Why are you telling us this? Ari asked. Because neither myself or the police or anyone but you right now can put a stop to what they are doing. I just... I want to help you. By doing that, I can also do my job. Jennifer frowned. Ari, people's families are being torn apart. People are afraid to go walking out on the streets. Day after day, we have parents, friends, significant others all come in and file reports begging us to find their loved ones. No matter how hard we look, we cannot find or track them down. This needs to be put to an end. You are their primary target now. They have become much more active now because the demon's protection is in place and it considers all of the people they have abducted as tools. This is still all part of the tradition then, I mumbled. Jennifer nodded. I am willing to help you in any way I can, but I need you two to work with me. Work with you how? Ari inquired. We have a task force in place to counter these cases. I'm a part of it with four other detectives. We've been hitting dead end after dead end. I was going to ask for the two of you to join us. I'm thinking that if that were to happen, then they should lose their protection since the demon would see the task force as a tool you were using against Riley and Fife. Jennifer explained. You think your higher-ups would just let two college students join in on an investigation? Somehow I doubt they'd be all for that, I said. It wouldn't be easy, note, but I think I could pull some strings and get them to allow it. 
If I vouch for the two of you, it should carry a good amount of weight. And with what little progress we have made in solving these cases, I think they could be open to the idea. Even if we are allowed to join, Kevin and I aren't detectives. We wouldn't be able to help out very much, Airy said. Airy, I don't need to work with more detectives. What I need is the help of my sister. I think you might also be surprised at what you can come up with. You two could notice something that we overlook. Eerie and I were both silent for a while. Picking up on our apprehension, Jennifer spoke up. Look, you can think about it. Call me if you decide to take up the offer. Jennifer called the waitress over for our bill, and she decided to pay for all of our meals, even though really only hers had been eaten at all. As she got up from the table to leave, she turned to Ari. I... You know I still want the best for you. We're still family. Even when the time comes, we will always be family. We can work together. Just... Just let me help you get through this. I'll talk to you later. She then looked over at me. It was nice to meet you, Kevin. A shame it was under these circumstances. Jennifer left the diner, leaving Ari and I sitting there contemplating what she had told us. What do you think? Ari asked. I was thinking that the entire thing sounded insane, not that I ended up voicing that thought to Ari. I don't know. If what Jennifer said is true about your sisters using people as tools, we would be much better off with the help of others. The two of us are probably not going to be enough to deal with them, I replied. Ari didn't turn to look at me when I answered. I could tell she was deep in thought. You might be right. We left the diner and I noticed that it was starting to drizzle. As we started making our way down the sidewalk to where Erie's car was parked, this drizzle turned to a downpour. Hey man, we passed a dude with his hood up, he called out to me, but I ignored him. This part of town was known for having a few panhandlers. The best thing you could do was just not pay them any attention. As we were walking, I noticed a peculiar car parked across the street. It took my mind a few moments to register it, but then I realized why I recognized it. It was the same car that I had thought was following us earlier. I couldn't believe it. That unease I felt, that paranoia, it was justified. I could see from behind the tinted windshield a figure looking directly at us. Suddenly I felt a sharp pain in my side. Looking down I noticed blood starting to stain my jacket by my stomach. Kevin? Harry looked over at me, wondering why I stopped. I grunted as the pain began to intensify. I was trying to talk to you. It ain't polite to ignore people. I heard a man behind me say with a cackle. I slowly turned my head to see the man that I had walked past just a few seconds earlier. He had this crazed look on his face, his eyes wide with lips curled into this sickening, sadistic smile. Those eyes, they were bloodshot, and the white around his pupils had become a crimson. I followed the man's arms to see a knife that he was holding, plunged into my back. I yelled out in pain as the man yanked the knife out of my back, its serrated edges ripping apart my flesh. The man began laughing hysterically like he was possessed. Then the man went careening backward, rolling across the ground. I looked over to see Ari, her hand outstretched with that purple glow surrounding it. She was clearly shaken, her eyes wide with terror. I held my side and nearly fell over. Looking at the blood that was slowly coating my hand, I began to feel woozy. Kevin! Ari grabbed me and helped keep me on my feet. The man got up off the ground and let out a moan, not one of pain, but one of pleasure. Looking over at us, he licked his lips and brought the blood-covered knife to his mouth. Oh, Daddy will be so happy when we bring you to him. He'll be so proud. I'll get all the pills I want. The man sliced the knife through his tongue. He looked like he was in a trance. We need to leave, Ari said as we started trying to head over to the car. We didn't get far before a woman bolted out from a nearby alley, nail bat in hand. This woman was the same as the man, eyes tinted red and bloodshot, an expression of unabated joy on her face. Ari tried to blast her away, but the woman was much to close and slammed her bat into Ari's shoulder. Ari screamed out in pain, the woman ripping the bat out and preparing for another swing. This time, Ari was able to blast the woman back, sending her tumbling into the wall of a nearby building. The woman got up. Her skull had been cracked against the brickwork of the wall. 
Yet even though blood trickled down her forehead, she showed no signs of feeling any pain. Mommy was right, they do have some special powers. I can't wait to see how they praise us for bringing them in. We need to make sure they don't escape, the woman said, stumbling towards us. I looked around and noticed that another three people were approaching us from across the street. They were trying to surround us on all sides. I felt Airy grip onto me tighter. We needed to get away from here, and we needed to do it fast. I had thought that dealing with Riley and Fife would have been similar to Leah. That couldn't have been further from the truth. The two of them and who they were working with were intelligent. They weren't just going to attack us head on if they could use other means. And they had those other means. They knew how to utilize the rules of the tradition to their advantage. They could predict what we were going to do and respond accordingly. They weren't in a rush. They were willing to play the long game if they had to. Time was not on our side in this situation. The longer we waited, the more the scales tipped into Riley and Fife's favor. With the drug-addled junkies closing in on us from all sides, I looked around for a way to escape. I could hear people on the streets beginning to panic. The attack had caused fear in people, but it didn't look like we'd be getting any help for our situation. There were only five people around us, but their spacing made getting through them impossible without coming within arm's length. Aerie pointed her hand at the ground, and the purple glow from it once again pulsed. The air around us seemed to warp and distort. I watched as our five attackers suddenly were lifted off of their feet and into the air. It wasn't only them, however, as a car parked beside us began lifting off of the ground too, as well as anything else that wasn't held to the ground. Even the rain falling around us stopped and floated, forming bubbles in the air. It was the first time I had seen her pull this trick out. It would have been fairly comedic, seeing people struggle to move as they were levitating in the air. Given the circumstances, I couldn't get a good laugh out of it. For whatever reason, I was able to keep my feet planted to the ground. Aerie and I rushed past the assailants and towards her car. When we reached it, I looked back to see gravity correct itself, and everything that was floating fall back to the ground with a crash. Shit, I heard Aerie say. Turning to see what happened, I saw our attackers had gotten to the car and slashed all of its tires. It seems like they weren't planning on letting us get away that easy. I saw the hooded man sprinting at us, knife held high in the air. As he brought it down, I pushed Aerie aside and held up my hand. The knife tore into my palm, stabbing through so I could see the blade sticking out of the back of my hand. I cried out in pain as I wound back my other hand and delivered a punch to the man's nose. He reamed back, blood flowing freely from his nostrils, a look of pure bliss on his face. I looked at my hand, the knife still embedded into it, ripping it out, I tossed it to the ground. Seeing the blood and rain mixing together, dripping down my hand, I felt my vision start to pulse. The world around me was starting to tint red. I blinked, but the tint grew stronger. Feel their love. Let it envelop you in its warm embrace, the hooded man yelled. I wondered what the hell was happening to me. Then looking down at the knife, I realized it. It was the same knife the man had cut his tongue open with, his blood coating part of the blade. His blood must have got into my body. It was causing me to suffer the effects of the tiger's blood. Another man charged towards me, wielding a rust-coated crowbar. Right before he got close enough to swing, he got blasted back, flying through the driver's side window of a nearby car. I could airy starting to pant behind me. A woman charged towards us, knife in hand. She too was blasted away, her body tumbling across the asphalt and coming to a stop when she crashed into a light post. Both of them got back to their feet, even though they must have broken bones and were bleeding. They showed no sign they were in any pain whatsoever. It felt like the only way we would be able to stop them would be to kill them or break their bodies enough that fighting back was impossible. I began to feel the pain in my body subside, replaced instead by this strange but enjoyable sensation. To think that even just trace amounts of the drug could subject you to its effects was a scary thought. I needed to get it out of my system. On top of that, we needed to get away from these maniacs, but we had no option to run. No A fight with them was going to be unavoidable. It was then I heard a scream from down the street, looking towards it. I saw that a couple of the assailants had gotten distracted with two pedestrians, a mother and her teenage daughter. 
The woman with the nail bat was relentlessly beating the mother on the ground, each strike hitting a place where it wouldn't be lethal, but would cause excruciating pain. While the daughter was being dragged off by another man towards a parked van, it was happening again, my mind going back to the events at the university. More innocent people were being attacked and murdered, and I was going to do nothing about it. Airy darted past me. She raised her hand up to the hooded man's chest. The purple glow around it intensified. The men looked down a smirk on his face as he went soaring through the air and through the display window of a nearby clothing store. I could see that Airy was running towards the mother and daughter. She must have felt at fault for them being in danger. These drug addicts were here for her anyhow. Of course she would feel guilty for others being put in danger because of her. I watched the man with the crowbar and the knife-wielding woman chased after Airy. What was I doing? The thought pervaded into my mind. Was I just going to sit here and do nothing? Airy was clearly getting tired. What if her powers gave out? Was I just going to stand by while she got killed? No, I couldn't keep doing nothing. Not when there was something I could do about. I'd flush this drug from my system, and at the same time I'd stop being a coward for once. I ran towards Airy. She was already a ways down the street. The man and woman were much closer to her than I was. In just a few moments they would be on top of her. I had to move faster. I pushed myself harder and felt my body becoming lighter. I slammed my shoulder into the woman knocking her and bolted in front of the man as he was swinging down his crowbar at Airy. I grabbed the crowbar and held it back. Kevin? Airy looked over at me, puzzled. You go help them, I can handle these two, I said. Airy nodded to me and continued down the street. The woman got up and charged at me and shoved the knife into my stomach, twisting it into my guts, crimson soaking through the fabric of my shirt. It didn't feel painful, it felt invigorating. It was time to give it what it wanted. I used my free hand and grasped the woman by her throat, feeling my skin beginning to peel apart, the black fur sprouting out from beneath, my bones and muscles beginning to shift and alter my flesh, my clothing beginning to tear and fall from my body as it grew too large to be contained by them. I found myself growing taller and taller, now looking down at my would-be killers. My hand turned to a claw, ever so slightly digging into the woman's neck. My mouth jutted forward into a muzzle, saliva trickled down from my new mouth as my lips curled into a snarl, the red tint in my vision being replaced by a drab-colored world. I ripped the crowbar from the man's hands and slammed the back of it across his face. As he stumbled back, I threw it at him, watching it slam into his chest and send him collapsing to the ground. I lifted the woman up off of the ground and raised my claw, readying to pierce it into her stomach and rip out whatever I grasped. Before I followed through with the attack, I stopped. Okay. I couldn't follow through with the attack and kill the woman. Feeling all of the rage and bloodlust pumping through my veins was a drug not dissimilar to what affected them. To destroy them would have filled me with nothing but satisfaction. It was what the wolf thrived on, bloodshed. I couldn't let it have full control, and if I killed even one of them. I didn't know if I would be able to hold myself back. I just needed to incapacitate them. I tightened my grip on the woman's neck, making sure not to gouge my claws into the supple flesh of her neck, instead choking her until I saw her consciousness fade. Tossing her onto the ground, I turned my attention to the man who was getting up. He picked up his crowbar and charged at me. They showed no sign of being afraid in the slightest. No pain, no fear, complete obedience. This drug would seem to have made the perfect soldier. To think at one point these people were just ordinary. To think it was this easy for them to lose themselves. As the man swung the crowbar at me, I caught his arm at the elbow. I bent his arm back, causing the bone to pierce through his skin. The man didn't cry in pain as he should have, instead moaning with delight. I grabbed him by the throat and lifted him up, preparing to choke him out the same as the woman. There was a sudden sharp pain by my neck as I turned to see the hooded man had returned with his knife dug deep into my collarbone. The hooded man had jumped onto my back. He pulled the knife out and stabbed it in again and again. Cackling the entire time, blood spraying out from the wound onto his face. I howled out in pain and tossed the man I was holding across the street. I grasped the hooded man and threw him overhead onto the ground, slamming his back against the asphalt. 
His head hit the concrete from the force of the throw, knocking him out. I gritted my teeth and dragged the hooded man's unconscious body up off of the ground. This burning hatred filled my mind. My lips curled back and drool spilled down my mouth as my maw widened to take a bite out of his neck. I stopped myself right before biting down, dropping the hooded man to the ground and stepping back from him. I was starting to feel my mind being torn away from me. It was beginning to take everything I had not to give in to my animalistic desires. I couldn't lose myself. I had to put a stop to it before I lost control of myself. I took a look over towards where Aerie was and saw that she succeeded in helping the mother and daughter. The two junkies that were after them both lying incapacitated on the ground. The mother and daughter were huddled together as I saw Aerie running over towards me. I could hear the sounds of police sirens closing in. I had to get out of this form before they arrived. Kevin? Aerie muttered. I could tell she was worried about how I was struggling to maintain my sense of self. Hmm. I tried to tell her I was okay, but the words caught in my throat. I tried to clear my head, but the wolf was howling at me to continue. It wasn't satisfied with this. It wanted to rip and tear to its heart's content. I couldn't let it gain control. There was no telling what it would do if it could roam the streets freely. I felt something grasp onto my arm and noticed Aerie looking up at me. The look of worry she just had gone. It's okay. You can do this. I pushed all thoughts from my mind and located that emotionless state. Gradually I returned to my human form, feeling the fur fall away from my skin and my body shrinking. I breathed a sigh of relief. Looking at Aerie, who had a smile on her face. Looking behind Aerie, I noticed something odd. Standing beside a parked car, the car that was following us to begin with, was a young woman. She was holding a digital camera aimed at us. She looked terrified. Aerie followed my gaze towards the woman with the camera. When the woman noticed both of us looking at her, she bolted into her car and sped off. Why was she here? And why was she in such a hurry to leave? I couldn't think about that very long before realizing the cops would be arriving soon, and I had no clothing on. Oh. Luckily, I had thought a bit ahead on this kind of thing happening. So there was an extra set of clothes sitting inside of Aerie's car. I hadn't planned on this sort of thing happening today or anything, but it doesn't hurt to be prepared just in case. I got myself dressed inside of the car, just in time to see the cop cars coming to a stop on the street. Needless to say, there was a decent bit of explaining to do, but when the cops found out the five people who attacked us were all under the influence of Tiger's blood, they were quick to pin all of the damage to the surroundings on them. It was odd how almost unconcerned with Aerie and I the officers were. Even the mother and daughter, who Aerie helped and who had to have seen her powers, didn't know precisely how Aerie helped them. I had heard that the demon intervenes in matters like this to ensure the tradition can be carried out in the way it wants. It was surreal seeing it happen right in front of me, though. The officers arrested all five people, the more injured ones being taken to the hospital first. The cops ended up chalking the whole thing up to a random act of violence. Since the attack fit the others like it that happened around the city, there was no way for them to know that they were targeting Ares specifically unless we told them. They didn't even question that much or want us to head down to the station. Under normal circumstances, this sort of conduct would have been unusual. Aerie ended up getting her car towed to a shop, and we had to call Miranda to come and pick us up. She wasn't too happy about us getting into her car soaking wet, but was more concerned about what had happened. So they're using their blood magic to make drugs that control people. How the hell did they come up with that? Miranda stated after having the situation explained to her. I don't know. Ever since they disappeared, I knew they had to be planning something but something like this. This is just horrible, Aerie said. Why did they disappear? I asked. Riley and Fife never really cared about anyone but each other. Even after they were given surgery to part the two of them, they would just spend every waking hour together. Then one day when they turned 18, the two of them just left one night, and we hadn't seen or heard anything about them since. There is no way of knowing exactly why they left. Same with our other sisters who just left the family, Miranda said. 
Would it have to do with the tradition? Miranda shook her head. Not for those. There was just something off about them. Jennifer wants us to work with her to stop them, Harry said. Makes sense. She can't do much against them otherwise, which means those girls have free reign of the city. Are you going to help her? Miranda asked. Erie was silent for a few moments, staring out at the rain. We don't have much of a choice, do we? If I don't do anything, they are just going to wait and kill me at their leisure, Erie said. They'll just keep on ruining people's lives all because I'm too afraid to die. Airy, you know that, Miranda started to say before Airy interrupted her. No, as long as I can do something about it, it's my fault. Tears begin to fall down Airy's face. I guess Airy had the same invasive thoughts that I had. How that guilt eats away at you, even though what is happening is out of your control. Take us to the station. I want to talk to Jennifer. Let her know that I will do whatever I can to help. You sure? Miranda asked. Eerie nodded her head. I'm sure I need to do this. Kevin, you're still with me, right? Of course, I replied. The decision seems so easy to make in hindsight, just your classic good versus evil predicament. Yet we would be dragged through hell by the end of this hunt. Not only us, but hundreds of other people would have their lives irreparably changed by the events. And the demon would get a show the likes of which he probably never imagined. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a detective. I was pretty enamored with the whole solving crimes and catching the bad guy aspect of the job. Probably from watching too many shows, it just looked like it could be fun. As I got older, I became less interested in pursuing that career, and my fascination with detective work faded away. Guess it was a little ironic that I'd be getting a taste of that experience. These crimes weren't like the ones they showed on television though, and the bad guys were not of the Saturday morning cartoon variety. Reality has a lot less romanticism when it comes to these things. We arrived at the police station and began to make our way inside. I don't know if any of you have ever visited Vitriol, but it's not a small place. Due to the size of the city, there are actually three police stations scattered around it. The one we were visiting was the headquarters, the place where a majority of the force was located. It was a pretty big building, four stories tall and taking up practically an entire block itself. Miranda parked the car across the street from the station and turned towards Erie. Sounds like this is going to be a lot of trouble. Don't worry, your big sister is here to help in any way she can. Miranda smirked. You don't need to do that, Erie replied. Miranda sighed. You don't expect me to just leave it all up to Jennifer. Besides, I may not need to, but I want to. The three of us headed into the police station brushing past a couple of officers that were leaving the building. The lobby itself was a little chaotic. There were at least a dozen citizens standing around, a few discussing things with some officers. By the tones of their voices, it was safe to assume that people were not happy. The topic that each person shared had to do with the rampant kidnappings. Many people unhappy with how ineffective law enforcement has been in protecting them and finding the people who were taken. We got to the reception desk, which was staffed by a rather tired-looking young officer. She looked like she hadn't slept in ages. Uh, is there a Detective Revenholt here? She wanted to meet with me, Aerie said. The officer shook her head, like an effort to push her fatigue away. And you are? Aerie Revenholt, I'm her sister. I see, let me just give her desk a call. The officer said, picking up the phone. That won't be necessary. Jennifer approached us from a hall to the right. She walked over to Aerie and hugged her. I heard about what happened. I shouldn't have left you alone there like that. You're okay, right? Jennifer noticed the small wound on Aerie's shoulder, and I could see her face drop. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm fine. Really, you don't need to be so worried, Aerie said, pulling back from Jennifer. She should be a bit worried. Miranda glared at Jennifer. Oh, you're here too. Jennifer's voice trailed off as she tried to look away from Miranda. I got this strange feeling from Jennifer's reaction to seeing Miranda. Now I'm not very good at reading people, mind you, but it was like a kid about to be scolded. Pretty unusual since even though Jennifer was younger than Miranda, she did look older and more professional. Yep, I'm here, 
Not all too good at investigative work, though, so I'll be counting on you, Jen. If you need my help, don't be afraid to ask, Miranda said. Right. If you follow me, I can take you to the room where the task force works from. Jennifer started leading us down a hallway and to a stairwell. You get permission already? Ari asked. Not exactly, but not like that matters much given what's been going on. I'll tell the chief about it when he's got the time. Workloads around the station have been increasing exponentially with the increase in criminal activity in the city over these past couple weeks, the majority of it being violent crime. You think all of it connected to Riley and Fife? Ari asked. No way this can be just the two of them. They have to be working with someone else, someone who has experienced crime. The task force base of operations was located on the fourth floor in this large room. A few desks pushed together in the center of the room covered with miscellaneous files. These shelves packed with binders lining the back of the room, and at the front was a corkboard that had a massive map of the entire city pinned to it. Multiple different pins of various colors were stuck throughout the map. Three men were standing together in front of the map. They were talking to each other, but stopped when they noticed us enter into the room. Judging by how they're dressed, it was pretty easy to tell they were the other detectives that Jennifer was working with. This is that help you were talking about, huh? One of the men said with a sigh. He was an older guy, his hair starting to turn gray. I could tell he wasn't all that enthused about our arrival. You don't need to have that attitude, Straff. Not like you've made any breakthroughs. Erie, Miranda, Kevin. This is the Tiger's Blood Task Force, Jennifer said. Jennifer introduced us to the members of the task force. There was the youngest looking guy there, Detective Coda. Seemed he was the freshest of the detectives there, this case being one of the first he was tasked with. Guy did come off as pretty nervous, guess that was to do with his inexperience. Not like I had any room to judge the dude. I was feeling horribly out of place there. Next was Detective Ferdinand. He looked to be in his early 30s. He was quite the cordial guy, greeting each of us with a handshake and a smile. I could tell he was someone who took his job seriously. He appeared to be a very down-to-earth and respectable guy. I mean, I got a good first impression from him at least. Finally, there was Detective Straff, the stereotypical old-school hard-boiled detective. Yep. This guy was by the books and not very trusting of the intuition of others. Not a very easy guy to work with, I'd wager. Still, he was the most senior detective on this case, and we would need to learn to work with him. There was one other detective on the force that wasn't in the room, Detective Reed. She wasn't here currently because she was attempting to question one of the assailants that attacked Ari and me. Right after Jennifer finished introducing everyone, Straff walked past her. Where are you going? Jennifer turned towards Straff. There was a robbery that just took place a few minutes ago. Suspects seem to be connected to the case. I want to check out the location. You don't need me around to bring our new... Straff shot me a glare. Why me specifically, I have no idea. But man, was it uncomfortable. Colleagues up to speed. Straff left the room before Jennifer could say anything back to him. I could tell by the look of annoyance on her face she was probably used to this sort of thing. Seems like he is just a joy to be around, Miranda said. That's Straff for you. Don't mind him too much. He comes off as a bit of a hard ass, but you get used to it, Ferdinand said. Coda, why don't you explain things to them? Ruh, right. I can do that. We all gathered in front of the corkboard, and Coda went about explaining what the pins and notes they had made on the map meant. They were tracking where all of the crime connected to the tiger's blood drug took place and labeling them with different colors of pins. Murders, assaults were red, abductions were green, and robberies were in blue. A lot of the green and red pins are overlapping, I remarked. Ah, that's because most of the assaults and murders all happen at the same place. People trying to stop the suspects or people just being around the area the abduction is taking place, Coda explained. And the places that were being robbed? Miranda asked. So far, a couple of hunting goods stores, a supermarket, and the latest was a gun shop. Somehow they were able to clean these places out without any of the security systems of these places triggering. By the time any officers arrived, they were long gone, Ferdinand said. That's a common theme among the activity. 
Somehow they are able to get away with these crimes without getting caught. That was until earlier today. Those five people that attacked you were the first to be apprehended. We're hoping to get some kind of information out of them, Jennifer said. Whoa, you were the ones they attacked. Pretty incredible you came away from that, okay? A look of shock ran over Coda's face. Wonder what his response would be if we actually told him how we dealt with the attack. I'm sure it would make for quite the reaction. Yeah, we got lucky, I guess, Ari mumbled. Has there been any pattern to the activity? I asked. Not that we could find. They can happen at any time in any part of the city. We think that there is a decent amount of planning going into them, so that we wouldn't be able to triangulate whatever place they are using as a hideout. Jennifer replied with a shrug. By keeping it random, it also makes it harder to connect the crimes together. The only way to tell if a crime is connected to the case is via eyewitness accounts. We can assume that there have been other crimes connected that we just have no knowledge of, Ferdinand added. It was a bit ironic how organized these activities appeared to be, juxtaposed with how brutal and merciless the acts carried out were. Seeing firsthand the insanity of the drug addicts, there had to be some mastermind behind it all, keeping them in line, giving orders from the shadows. If it wasn't just the twin sisters, then I could only imagine what person could be behind all of this. How many people have been reported missing or killed? Ari asked. There are currently 85 people missing and 120 killed since this whole thing started, Jennifer said. The air in the room seemed to go cold. It was clear that the number made everyone uncomfortable, myself included. Ferdinand shook his head. Nothing like this has ever happened in this city, and we're no closer to solving it now than we were a month ago. If you don't mind me asking, could I go watch that interrogation you brought up earlier? Miranda asked. I don't see any problem with that, Jennifer said. I can guide you over there. I'd wanted to check on Reed's progress, Ferdinand said. I'd like to tag along too, I said. I was pretty curious to see just what they were able to get out those guys. Eri, there was something I wanted to discuss with you. We can do that while they go over there, Jennifer said. Eri nodded her head and walked over to her, while Miranda and I followed Ferdinand out of the room. I hope we can get this whole thing solved soon. My wife's worried sick thinking I'm going to get killed by some maniac. Ferdinand rubbed the back of his neck. Do you think they could be planning something big? I asked. No. We can hope not, but that's what we're trying to figure out. The fact that they were targeting places with weapons and supplies to rob does make it seem like they are preparing for something. Ferdinand guided us into a small dark room beside the interrogation room where we could look in on the session through a one-way mirror. Inside the room was an officer, a woman who Ferdinand pointed out as Detective Reed, and sitting across from her was the man I recognized as being the first guy to attack me, handcuffed. With his hood down, I could see how disheveled he was, hair matted with blood and grime coating his face. His eyes were still that dark scarlet hue from when I first saw him. No, it was a bit different, darker. I could see sweat was dripping down the man's brow as well, his teeth clenching tightly and grinding together. Looking at him, he seemed to be in pain. Tell me, what's the reasoning behind these abductions? Reed asked. The man tilted his head, maintained direct eye contact with Reed. Daddy, Daddy wants cubs, wants fresh blood. The man made it look like it was a struggle for him to talk. Cubs? What do you mean? Reed asked. Us? We, we are all, ki cubs. All who dry, drink the, the blood, are high, his cubs. The man stuttered out. Everyone who takes the drug, the tiger's blood, that's who you're referring to? Reed asked. The man nodded his head quickly. And who is this daddy you keep talking about? Reed asked. Daddy? That guy said something about him when he attacked me and Eri. Something about this daddy rewarding him for abducting us, I said. Is that right? So whoever he is, he's got something that these people are willing to kill over. Ferdinand responded. I can't say, hey, he wouldn't lee like that. I wouldn't get any more blood. Reed slid over a small container she had on her side of the table and opened it, pulling out a clear plastic bag containing a little red pill. You mean this, tiger's blood. The moment the man laid eyes on the pill, he bolted out of his chair and dived over the table towards Reed. 
In a panic, Reed back away from him, slamming against the wall. I need it. Give. Give it to me. The man screamed at the top of his lungs. The officer in the room grabbed hold of the man and dragged him back. As he was holding him, though, the man reeled his head back and bit into the officer's cheek, tearing off a huge chunk of flesh with his teeth. The officer cried out and tossed the man at the back wall. The wound on the officer's face was deep, his teeth being able to be seen through the hole in his cheek. The officer took out his nightstick and slammed it into the man's skull. This sickening crack sounded as the man's head opened, blood spurting out from the wound. Jesus fucking Christ. Ferdinand ran out of the room Miranda and I followed after him. When we got to the interrogation room, we saw that the drug addict was on the ground. The officer was relentlessly beating him over the head in this violent frenzy. Blood was now pooling from that side of the room, oozing under the table towards the doorway. The sound of flesh and bone being tenderized mixed with this manic laughter from the officer as each swing became more and more vicious. You like that, you piece of shit? The officer shouted, reeling his nightstick back, the entire thing covered in gore. What the hell are you doing? Ferdinand yelled, rushing over and grabbing the officer. The officer shoved Ferdinand back and raised his nightstick at him. The officer's eyes were crimson. He was under the influence of the tiger's blood. How the fuck? Ferdinand's voice trailed off. It was similar to what happened to me. You don't need to take the drug to have it affect you. Any bodily fluid from someone who has taken it getting into your system would be enough to cause its effects. You want some too, don't you? The officer swung at Ferdinand, who backed away from the swing. Get a fucking hold of yourself! Ferdinand yelled, rushing the officer and grabbing him. Ferdinand forced the officer face first onto the table, but was clearly struggling to keep him held. I could use some help in here, Ferdinand yelled. I noticed that Reed was in a state of shock, still standing against the wall, her eyes wide, just staring at the scene unfolding in front of her. Suddenly, a couple of officers rushed past me into the room and helped grab hold of the frenzied policeman. They managed to just barely handcuff him, the drugged officer almost managing to overpower the three men. The two officers that came into the room started escorting the now handcuffed officer out as he continued screaming obscenities and struggling against them. Ferdinand leaned against the wall, and I saw him take a look over at the hooded man. I entered the room and got a look at him myself. He was unrecognizable, his head reduced to a pile of meat and bone, surrounded by bits of brain and an ever-expanding pool of crimson. Luckily, it didn't seem that the drug could travel airborne. Why? I heard Ferdinand mutter. Seems like he got put under the effects of the drug when the guy bit him, I said. It probably can be transferred through any bodily fluid, Miranda said. Ferdinand took a breath and composed himself. If that's the case, we should get this clean it up as soon as possible. There goes one of our potential leads. Reed, you all right? Reed was still shaking like a leaf, but nodded and tried to take some deep breaths. She looked to be about as young as Coda, if not younger. I'd assume she was new here too. Although I think most people in this situation would probably have a similar reaction. Ferdinand walked past her out into the hall and stopped suddenly. There was this loud commotion that could be heard from the lobby. I couldn't make out exactly what it was from where we were, but it sounded like screaming and yelling. What the fuck is happening today? Ferdinand muttered as he started down the hall towards the uproar. Miranda looked over to me and nodded towards the direction that Ferdinand went. I exited the room, and the two of us quickly followed after him. Entering into the lobby, I could hear the sounds of screaming were coming from the hall on the opposite side. People were wondering what was happening, having just caught a glimpse of the frenzied officer being dragged away. The officers were trying to ease people's concerns. Still, with that almost inhuman shrieking bleeding into the room louder and louder, it wasn't easy. Miranda and I followed Ferdinand down the hall towards the screaming. The source of the noise was coming from the holding cells, the place where they were holding the rest of the people that attacked Ari and I. When we got to the corridor with the cells, there were a couple of officers there, this uneasy shock on their faces as they were looking into the cells. What's happening? Ferdinand asked. I don't know, they just started freaking out. One of the officers answered. 
The woman in the cell closest to us slammed into the steel bars of the cell. Blood splattered across the floor, landing right before my feet. The woman's eyes were no longer red. They were near pitch black, the only color coming from her pupils. The woman threw herself against the bars over and over again. I could see her skull begin to deform, becoming more and more pronounced with each slam. Her blood, I assume that was what it was, had turned to this viscous black slime, seeping out from her tear ducts, oozing out of her mouth, and I could see it coming out of tiny cuts and tears in her skin. I could see Ferdinand was at a loss for words. One of the officers began to approach the cell, and Ferdinand grabbed him and pulled him back. Shouldn't we try to restrain them or something? He asked. Don't risk touching her. The drug can pass through bodily fluids. It would be too risky. We just let them keep going? Before Ferdinand could answer, the woman started forcing herself into the gap between the bars of the cell. The hole wasn't very large, mind you. There was no feasible way for them to push through that space. At least, that was what I thought. The woman's head was the first part of her body to get forced through, the skin and parts muscle peeling away, and that black sludge secreting from the injuries created a sort of lubricant. This horrendous smell flooded the air, a stench of rot. The woman's head pushed through the bars and her body started to follow. Her bones seemed to have turned to rubber as she squeezed out of the cell, crashing into a mess of black fluids. Her arms and legs contorted into awkward angles. She lacked any strength to keep moving after she got out of the cell, instead writhing there on the ground. Her screams had turned into desperate gasps for air and pained cries before she went quiet. The woman stopped moving her blackened eyes rolling out of their socket. It was like her body was deteriorating. The same thing happened to the other man they had locked up here. He was collapsed in a pile of that black sludge, leaking from every orifice of his body. You didn't need to touch them, or even get close to know they were dead. Seeing what happened, I had an inkling of what the cause was. I then came to a horrific realization when I remembered where the other two attackers were. The hospital. That's where the other two people that were arrested were sent, right? I said. Ferdinand looked over to me and his eyes widened. Shit, Ferdinand rushed past Miranda and I. The three of us went back out into the hall where we were headed off by Coda. We have some problems, he said. Is it the hospital? Ferdinand asked. Coda shook his head, puzzled. No. There have been sudden attacks at several locations all of them spaced across the city, two stores being robbed, multiple random assaults, and a large-scale abduction. This would be the first taste of the demented planning that the mastermind behind all of this would use. They were making sure to hit multiple locations at once to force the police to be split across the city. Of the two stores being robbed, only one of them was their actual target, the other merely being a way to waste law enforcement time and resources. The same for all of the random assaults happening. Each was just to cause havoc and distract. These cubs would be hiding out waiting for the officers to arrive and would then do whatever they could to sabotage and waste their time. They would place spikes on the road to ruin the cars, assault the officers with non-lethal yet destructive weapons. The actions the cubs took were calculated with definite goals in mind. They were not the acts of some drug-crazed fiends. The officers responding to this sudden rash of calls were not all killed, but a majority of them were injured in some way. We had no way of knowing at the time that this was their aim. At the time, the attacks just seemed to be random acts of violence with no clear goal. The large-scale abduction, that on the other hand, had an obvious motive. Apparently, this high school class had been taking a trip out to the nature park just outside of the city. The station had just gotten a call that the class had not returned at the scheduled time they should have. When a few park rangers were notified of this and checked the park, they came across the bodies of the two teachers who were chaperoning the class. There was no sign of what had happened to the rest of the students. It could be assumed from the brutality of the injuries inflicted on the teachers that this was connected to Tiger's blood units were already responding to the robberies and assaults but there was no place to even start looking for the missing class. Ferdinand gritted his teeth. They're just playing us for fools at this point. Coda, I'm going to head over to Vitriol General. Try to get an extra unit to head over there. And also try to get the bodies cleaned up. Be careful about touching them. Bodies? Coda mumbled. 
Something happened to our suspects. I'd like to get an autopsy on them as soon as possible. Coda nodded, though I could tell he was still trying to process what Ferdinand meant. Right. Coda walked off, and just as Ferdinand was about to leave, he turned to us. You two should stay here. It'd be too dangerous for you to come with me. Tell Revenholt and Reed about how the drug is transferred, and about... Well, whatever the hell that back there was about. Honestly, we need to inform the entire force of that. Dealing with these crazies just got a whole lot harder. Ferdinand left the two of us there, and I noticed that Miranda had this intense, conflicted look on her face. What is it? I asked. Miranda shook her head. It's nothing. I'm just thinking about some things, she replied. The two of us went back to the task force room, finding Airy, Jennifer, and Reed each inside. Reed still looked a bit shook up. She had already told Airy and Jennifer about the incident in the interrogation room. We told them about the sudden deaths of the people in the cells and about Ferdinand heading to the hospital. That guy really couldn't have taken a minute to ask one of us to go with him, Jennifer said. With everything happening right now, we should be cautious. The person behind manufacturing Tiger's blood, do you have any idea who they are? Even just a guess? I asked. There's one man who could fit the bill, Jennifer said. He's someone who had broken out of Albatross Island a couple years back. Albatross Island was a prison island similar to Alcatraz. It was located just off of the coast of the city, little more than a few miles out from the bay. It was a maximum security prison that held a large number of high-level criminals. Escape from there was pretty much impossible. I guess it would be unless you happened to get the help of a few certain people. Who would that be? Airy asked. Desmond Killick. Before he was arrested, he manufactured all kinds of illicit substances, while at the same time controlling how it was distributed. By the time he was caught, he had already amassed millions of dollars of wealth off the back of his drug trafficking, Reed explained. Another thing, the guy had a fascination with trying to create drugs that could control people. He had conducted numerous experiments where he would attempt to try and manufacture a drug that would be capable of this. He never succeeded. That is, until now it would seem. Tiger's blood appears to be the exact drug that Desmond was trying to create, Jennifer told us. How did he escape from prison, I asked. He just up and vanished one day. There's no footage of him leaving. No one saw him exit his cell. One day he was just gone, Jennifer said. Someone had to help him get out, right? I could tell by the look on each of the sisters' faces that they knew the answer to that question. Guess I hardly needed to ask. It should have been obvious. With there not being any evidence of how he escaped, we can't say... Seems like he would have had to with how tight security is on the island, Reed said. As the day ended, the incidents that had occurred throughout the past few hours came to a halt. There were no suspects arrested for any of the other crimes committed. A few of the cubs were shot and killed. As I stated earlier, a large number of officers responding to the calls were injured. Some had acid splashed onto them, others suffering broken bones from the cubs' attacks. There were a few, however, that were killed in ambushes by the cubs. There were a few more officers that got infected with the drug and were forced to be held in cells to prevent them from attacking others. There seemed to be no way to flush the drug from their system. It was like once it was in your bloodstream, there was nothing you could do to rid yourself of it. Well, if you were a normal human, that was. Being a familiar was the only thing that managed to keep the drug from overrunning my system. The cubs that were at the hospital each suffered the same fate as the ones at the station, though not before lashing out against the staff at the hospital. This resulted in a couple nurses and one doctor being killed before things were brought under control by the officers and security staff at the hospital. Of the two stores that were being robbed, the one the cubs were actually targeting was another gun shop. They stripped the place clean, killing the owner of the shop and every customer inside at the time they arrived. Whatever it was that this Desmond guy was planning, it was going to be a fucking atrocity if the number of guns he was stealing was any indication. The police chief attempted to ask for aid from the military to prep for any big attack, but assistance was refused. The city would be entirely on its own to deal with what was going on. It sounds insane, I know. 
How the hell could the government not get involved when things were so obviously heading towards a catastrophe? But you should know by now this kind of thing is just the way of the world. Human will doesn't mean shit to a being millennia old, it seems. Honestly, this is the same fucker that turned an entire family legacy into witches and has them off each other for a laugh. Guy just does whatever he wants. Things were looking pretty grim at the time. I'm still around now, so you probably think it couldn't have been that bad. I can get your take on that after relaying the whole story. Jennifer decided to ask Ari if she would stay at the station until things were figured out. It made sense. The twins knew pretty much where she would be. If we were staying at the apartment together, it would have been quite easy for them. Just come and attack us again. The police station just seemed to be the safest place to stay. Ari ended up agreeing to stay, as for myself as well as Miranda and Victor. It was decided we would stay at a hotel nearby to the police station. Jennifer would be staying at the station with Ari. I felt awkward just leaving Ari at the station, but in my mind she was going to be safe here. If things did end up going bad, well, Miranda and Victor were staying just one room over from me. If we needed to, we could get to the station pretty quick. Miranda and I headed for the hotel we would be staying at, meeting Victor in the parking lot. Miranda had already informed Victor about the events. He seemed more annoyed with things than actually worried about them. I wish I could have that guy's nerves. When I got into my room, I fell onto the bed and just laid there for a little while. How did things just keep getting more and more complicated? What a scary world we live in. I thought I was hearing things at first when I noticed this quiet scratching noise coming from somewhere. Sitting up, I looked around to try and pinpoint the source of the sound. It was coming from the door into the room. Getting up, I checked through the peephole of the door, but could see nothing. Opening it up, I nearly jumped out of my skin when Aster bolted into the room. He ran and leapt up onto the bed and turned to me, wagging his tail. He was holding an envelope in his mouth. I looked left and right in the hall, but there was no sign of his owner. I shut the door and walked over to Aster, taking the envelope from him. I wasn't sure if they let dogs into this hotel, but somehow he got in here. I unsealed the envelope and pulled a letter out from inside of it. Unfolding it, I was greeted by the name of yet another sister, one that carried with it some substantial implications. Kevin, I'm sorry to trouble you like this. My name is Linnae Revenholt, the eldest sister of our family. I've never been one to believe in prophecies or fate or any of that stuff. I just looked at life as something that happened. No meaning, no direction, just us floating in this endless expanse of blackness on a tiny blue little sphere. You'd think that my mind would have changed with what has happened over the past couple of months, but not really. I wonder if the demon is just looking for some meaning for his existence. Guess it's a lonely, sad life when you have nothing but time and few ways to spend it. Maybe he's not a demon at all, instead just some godlike being who's struggling to come to terms with what he is, distracting himself with humanity, so he doesn't have to look inward and realize how pointless its existence is, in a way that would make it pretty human. If I ever got the chance, I would like to ask him why he keeps this curse going. I doubt I would ever get that chance, but it would probably make for an interesting conversation. Kevin, I'm sorry to trouble you like this. My name is Lenny Revenholt, the eldest sister of our family. I know this must be confusing for me to give you this message. Know that while you don't know me, I have known about you for quite some time. I need you to listen to me. It is of utmost importance. You must follow Aster. He will take you somewhere you need to go. I can understand if you don't trust me, but you won't be alone. As I finished reading the letter, I heard a knock at the door. Looking out through the peephole, I saw Victor standing on the other side. Opening it up, he held up a folded up letter to me. You get one too, bro? He asked. I nodded and felt something brush past my leg. It was Aster, heading out into the hallway. Staring up at us, Aster yipped and patted his paws on the ground, wanting us to follow him. Guess that answers that question. You really trust that letter? I asked. Victor shrugged. If they wanted to kill us, I doubt they'd send us a letter. There were two sisters that I never met or heard about in the eleven years I've known Miranda, those being the eldest too. I don't know why, but she avoids talking about them. What can I say? 
I'm curious to meet them. I glanced over at Aster, who was acting more and more restless as we stood in the hall. Remembering the man who owned Aster, I thought that things would end up being okay. I mean, if the guy wanted to do me harm, he could have done it then. It would have been pretty easy considering the state I was in back then. All right, let's go then, I replied. Victor and I followed Aster out of the hotel and into the streets. The puppy led us down the block, sometimes dashing ahead and waiting for us to catch up while he pissed on some lamppost or sniffed around some trash bin. Miranda's not coming along, I see, I remarked. The letter said not to let her know, kind of suspect, but given the circumstance, she didn't wonder where you were going. Victor took out a joint from his pocket and lit it. Taking a hit, he blew out a puff of smoke into the air. I just told her I was going out for a smoke and to stretch my legs a bit. Pretty much the truth. Can't really fault that logic. Better than telling Miranda that he was going to follow some dog around the city in the middle of the night to meet up with her estranged sister that could, or could not, want to murder us. The air was chilly, a cold wind blowing between the buildings. If not for my alert state, I'd have been freezing my ass off. Walking around the streets was unnerving. There were sparsely any cars driving around, and Victor and I were seemingly the only people out walking around at this hour. The fact that I knew crazed drug addicts were prowling about the recesses of the city, looking to mime and murder me, was not a reassuring thought either. Hey bud, how much farther? Victor called out to Aster. Aster didn't pay him any attention, just continuing to walk forward and turning another corner. Shit. I should have really taken a shit before deciding to do this. Since we're stuck walking out here, mind if I ask you something? I said to Victor, zipping up my jacket the rest of the way. Shoot, my man, he replied. How'd you end up meeting Miranda? I asked. Sorry if that comes off as an odd question. Curious about that, huh? Victor grinned, letting out another puff of smoke from between his lips. It's not all that interesting. It was back in March of 2008. My boxing career had just started and I was doing great. Taking the scene by storm was how some people put it. Only things weren't good for me very long. My mom was diagnosed with cancer when I was just a child. Things were rough for a while going through school, but she managed to beat it and it went into remission. It stayed that way for about nine years, then one day it suddenly came back. This time she wasn't able to fight it as well. I got the call minutes before I was going to have a match. It was my father telling me things had taken a turn for the worse and that she might not make it through the night. Victor took another long drag. His eyes had a slight glint to them. I took the biggest beating of my entire career that night. After it was over, I looked like a fucking train wreck. My head was just not in it, but for whatever reason, I went through with the fight. I wanted to avoid facing reality. After the fight, I left without getting any treatment for my injuries and wound up in some bar. Sitting there, drinking myself stupid as my phone blew up with calls from my father and sister, wondering where the hell I was. It was then that this girl wearing her goth clothes and coming off as some Wiccan wannabe decided to take a seat next to me and ask why I looked like shit. She thought I had been mugged, and no matter how much I tried to get her to leave me alone, she kept on talking to me. She ended up treating my injuries in the bar's bathroom. When she asked why I was trying to drown myself in whiskey, that's when I broke down. Just became a fucking mess. Victor laughed. She listened to all of it for whatever reason. She ended up convincing me to go to the hospital. You need to be there for your family, even if it hurts you. She was right. I mean, I already knew I should have been there but it helped having it all put into perspective. My mother ended up passing away that night, but I was there by her side. Victor went silent for a little while. I'm sorry. Cancer is a rough way to go. I said. Shit happens, what can you do? Miranda ended up giving me her number that night if I ever felt like talking with her about stuff. And at some point, I got dragged into her crazy family and turned into a mythological creature. I don't regret meeting her, though, no matter what ends up happening in the future. Things just feel right, you know? Would I end up regretting meeting Ari at some point? I had met her when I wasn't in such a great place myself. In fact, 
It was one of the darkest periods of my life where I had to force myself to get out of bed each day. Each hour just a spiral of debilitating depression that weighed on me heavier and heavier. The day before I met Ari, I tried to kill myself. I don't know why I said that. I guess hearing Victor getting all personal triggered something in me to begin oversharing. Victor was quiet, but I could tell he was waiting for me to continue. My family despises me for not being like my brother. Not as smart as him, not as athletic, not as outgoing as he was. They didn't care that we were two different people. Day after day, I tried to do what I could to make them happy, clawing away at every part of myself that wasn't wanted and trying to tear them out. Nothing I did was ever enough. I took a deep breath and sighed. Even when I got into the same college that he went to, they didn't care. They would always find some other flaw to pin to me so they could continue berating me. This kept on continuing. I felt myself falling deeper and deeper into depression, wondering what I was doing wrong. Nothing was wrong with you, Victor said. I know that now. One day I had hit my lowest point. I grabbed a box cutter and locked myself in one of the stalls in the dorm bathroom, sitting on the toilet, and I pushed out the blade and held it against my wrist. I left the job half finished, stopping myself when I started to see all of the blood leaking out and run down my arm, puddling on the floor. I got out of that stall as fast as I could and started to try and staunch the bleeding with paper towels, coating one of the sinks crimson. God, just remembering that time I could feel myself becoming lightheaded. All that pain and misery as I desperately tried to keep myself from dying. Luckily for me, the cut I made was shallow enough that I was able to treat myself with the first aid kit we had lying around the commons area of the dorm. It's good that no one else was there to see me. The last thing I wanted to deal with was other people. After I got myself bandaged, I cleaned up all of the blood in the bathroom that I left on the floor and in the sink. The next day I went to the library just to sit there and pretend to study. I was caught off guard when Ari popped up behind me and asked me about the book I was reading, some biology textbook that I had just picked up randomly. She was having trouble understanding the material, and our first meeting turned into a tutoring lesson pretty much. It really left an impact on me though. After that I would head over there a few times a week, when I knew she'd be there. We became friends after that. She helped me to not feel so trapped in life. To think that all of this would end up happening, can't say it was something on my mind. We have sex. I turn into a werewolf, and then the day after I'm nearly eaten by a man who can turn into a pig. Now I get to deal with some maniacs jumping out of the alleys and trying to gut me. I sighed, watching my breath turn to fog and drift through the air. You were dealt a shit hand, that's for sure. Victor finished off his joint and crushed it beneath the heel of his shoe. He patted my shoulder. For what it's worth, I'm around to try and help. Wouldn't there come the point when Miranda's next in line to hunt Aerie? If that happens, then you and I... My voice fell away from me before I could finish the sentence. We can worry about that when the time comes. Until then, you can count on me. Victor turned away from me as he continued. It might not seem like it, but I do care about Aerie. In a way, she's become like family to me. I don't want to kill her. I don't want to kill you either. But we do what we have to for the ones we love. You should understand that now, Victor said. Right, I mumbled. Let's just live in the present. We might as well make the most of our lives in spite of this fucking mess. We can still do some good. We can still be happy, so we should try. Even if all of this is short-lived, there are still things we can do to help people, Victor said. Maybe he was right. This tradition encompassed more than just Ari and her sisters. Everyone in this city was affected by it in some way. Even if I didn't ask for this, I was in it now, and I had the power to do something about it. You could look at it like I had gotten a new meaning to my life. My train of thought was interrupted when I heard Aster start barking. Looking up at him, I noticed he had come to a stop in front of the entrance to Redisser Park. It was this big park in the center of the city. Aster plodded inside of the park, yipping for us to follow him. Looks like we're finally getting to the place. Man, I haven't been here in ages. You ever hear about that urban legend about some spider lady roaming the park at night? Victor asked. Yeah, it just turned out to be a hoax, though. 
I replied. No, what a shame. I thought it was pretty cool. We followed Aster to this pond that sat in the middle of the park. Walking around the edge of the water, we came across a man sitting on a bench. Aster went over to him and jumped up on the bench. The man stroked Aster's chin. Good boy, the man said. When he turned to look over at us, I recognized his face. It was the same middle-aged man I had met in the alleyway a week back. Kevin, Victor, it is a pleasure to meet the two of you. My name is... Let's just have you call me Virgil. Sir. I thought the person that wanted to meet with us was Lene. Victor said, Mind if I ask where she's at? Cause you're the only person I see here. Don't worry, I'm right here. I heard a woman's voice from behind us. Turning around, I saw a woman who couldn't have been older than her mid-twenties. She seemed to just materialize out of thin air, a white glow dissipating off her hand. I'm Lini Revenholt. It's nice to finally meet the two of you in person. Were you following us? Victor asked. The woman nodded. I was making sure the two of you were alone. I assume that also meant she heard all of that conversation we were having. Kinda awkward, knowing we were being eavesdropped on by someone we couldn't even see. Why'd you want to meet with us? I asked. Lene's expression went sullen. I want to try and help you. Listen, Riley and Fife are not working alone. They are being helped by a woman named Korea. She's the reason that half of my siblings' lives were ruined and helped lead each of them into losing themselves, Lene said. Kriya, I asked. Who is she exactly? The second oldest sister, she was born just a few years after me. For whatever reason, she has embraced the demon and his power completely, revering him. She doesn't care about anything other than pleasing him, even if it means destroying her own family. I, I didn't see it until it was too late. I was so concerned with finding a way to put an end to this damn curse that I didn't notice what she was doing. In the process of trying to help my sisters, I abandoned them. That's why Miranda never talks about you. In her mind, that's exactly what you did, Victor said. I know, Lene muttered. Why don't you meet with them and talk to them? I asked. I can't, because after all this time, I still haven't figured out enough. The only thing I found was him. Lene nodded over at Virgil. I thought he was your familiar, I said. I don't have one. I never wanted to take on a familiar since I was so certain I'd find a way to stop all of this, Lene said. A look of contemplation came over Victor's face as he turned towards Virgil. Virgil was sitting with Aster asleep on his lap. He was just staring out at the pond, not paying too much mind to the conversation we were having. At least I thought he wasn't. You're going to ask if I can put a stop to the killing. Sorry, I'm just here as an observer. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Victor shouted. How the hell are you involved in all of this? Victor walked over to Virgil. I'm here to see what happens to watch. Victor grabbed onto Virgil's jacket and pulled him up. Aster hopped down and started barking and tugging at Victor's pant leg. Watch? So you've seen everything going on? Victor asked. All of it since the moment that each of them was born. Virgil replied, I'm not here to act, Victor. That's not my purpose in all of this. How, how could you just sit by when... Victor's hands began to shake. You could have stopped it. Those terrible things were inevitable. While I couldn't act, it isn't as if I am without empathy. It is the burden I carry, witnessing atrocities and being unable to stop them. Virgil said, looking directly at Victor, what is he talking about, I asked. My sisters were under constant harassment from people when they were growing up. It intensified more and more as they grew older. The things that happened to Leah, Riley, Fife, and Madeline were... Lene's eyes began to tear up. Things happened to them that destroyed who they were. Part of me wanted to pry into what those things were, but I didn't want to pry into it. Whatever the case was, it was clear that from the way Victor and Lene were acting, it was quite serious. Victor let go of Virgil and stepped back from him. There's a way, right? To put an end to this without killing? Victor asked. Perhaps there is. I couldn't tell you. Virgil replied. I still think there is. Lene started. I haven't given up yet, but Kriya is doing all she can to keep me from learning more about what's going on. She is hiding something if I can find out what it is. 
There may be a chance to break the curse. Is there anything we can do to help, I asked her. The best thing you can do is to try and put a stop to the twins. They're just puppets at this point if they aren't stopped soon. I hesitate to think of what they will end up doing. They need to kill Aerie first though, keep her safe. I think this doesn't need to be said, but I need the two of you not to tell my sisters that we met. Sure, Victor muttered. I just nodded to her. Lene went on to ask for our phone numbers, which I was a bit reluctant to give her, but did relent. She said she was going to use them to contact us if something came up, or if she made any headway into finding out a way to end this fucked up tradition. Thank you. You two should be getting back now, Lene said. Hopefully in the future, we can meet under different circumstances. Lene's body faded from sight before our eyes. I still haven't a good idea of what she is actually doing when she does that. Maybe that's something to ask her about next time I talk to her. I don't know if she would tell me about it or not. She seems to be hiding things to herself. Virgil and Aster had disappeared along with her, leaving just Victor and I standing alone in the park. Let's just get back to the fucking hotel. I'm sick of standing out here in this cold. Victor started walking back, not waiting up for me. I caught up to him, and the two of us exited the park. What do you think? I asked. I don't fucking know, man, Victor said. Suddenly his phone started to ring. Victor pulled out his phone and took a look at the screen. It's Miranda. She's probably getting worried since we've been out so long. Victor answered the phone and he stopped in his tracks. I saw his face go pale, his eyes widened. Victor? I stopped next to him. Victor's hands trembled as he took the phone away from his ear and switched on the speakerphone. Immediately, the sounds of Miranda's tormented screams ripped through the speakers. What the fuck, I muttered. Ah, you did it. Nice job, big bro. We gotta have Aerie's cute boyfriend in on this too. A woman's voice came in over the speaker. Sorry about the noise. Riley's trying to make sure the cubs aren't too rough with her. I hope you remember me, big bro. I remember you. Fife, Victor mumbled. You remembered. It's been so long, too, Fife replied, her voice giddy with excitement. What are you doing to Miranda? Victor asked. Huh? Just punishing her for helping out Aerie. She should know not to pick favorites among sisters. What we're doing, exactly. Miranda let out another scream and pleaded for someone to stop. Fife giggled. I don't think I'll say. Wait, I said. You shouldn't be able to hurt her, right? Ah, that'd be the new guy. You sound like a dweeb. Hey, you're sort of right. Riley and I can't do anything to her. Other people can, though. Long as we make sure she stays alive and make sure her injuries aren't permanent. We can have her hurt all we want. You'd be surprised at the things you can do given those restrictions. Makes us get a bit creative. What the hell do you want? Victor demanded. Hey, hey, new guy. I got a question for you. How did Leah taste? I'm really curious. I didn't even know how to respond to that. This person wasn't right in the head. Not gonna answer? Oh, you're no fun. Answer me, Fife. What do you want? Victor shouted. Bro, calm down a little. She's not gonna die. You can chill out. Besides, you're the one that left her there alone. You're not a very good familiar, huh? And it isn't really what I want, but what we want. It's really simple. We just want to even up the odds a little. Three sisters against two ain't very fair. Ah, uh, bro, if only you were here. We're bringing back such great memories. I wish Aerie was with you. God, I know she'd just be begging for us to stop. Hearing that bitch plead and whine. Fife's breathing intensified. She started gently moaning. Fuck, how I'd like to see her groveling before me. I'd tear out her intestines and choke that little whore with them. Make her scream more. I need to hear more. Miranda cried out in pain, her voice mixing in with Fife's orgasmic moans. Cut it out. Why? Why are you doing this? Victor clenched his fist tight. I could see his nails digging into his fingernails, digging into his palm. Why? Because she deserves it. Her, Ari, Jennifer. All of them could never understand even an ounce of the pain we went through. They acted like they care when in reality they were just happy it wasn't them. No, they loved it. Well, time's up now, for all those happy fucking memories they've had. We'll create a horrible one for each. Mm. 
What could have happened to them that turned them into such monsters? To think that they could be capable of harboring such hatred and anger. It almost felt like they were possessed by a demon. Why don't you run along and tell our beloved sisters about dear Miranda now? We don't want anything from you. You can do your best to find us. That is if you can, before we come for you. Fife laughed. Oh, Kevin was it? I look forward to meeting you in person, cutie. I'm going to make sure to eat you in front of Aerie, just to savor the taste of her despair. Good luck. The call ended abruptly and Victor slammed his fist into a nearby light pole. The metal of the pole bent and it collapsed over onto the street. That night was a nightmare that would just never end. It was a message that was dug into my mind loud and with crystal clarity. That the world I had now found myself had no place for someone like me. A world that would consume the weak and innocent alive. The only ones who survived in it were those who were willing to become monsters themselves. There have been a lot of days lately that I have wanted to forget, and I know there will be plenty more still to come. Still, I feel like I have been losing myself piece by piece. The person who I was being chipped away and replaced by someone who keeps me awake at night. There is something wrong with me, something broken inside of me that I can't fix. I just want to go back to being normal. I hate living like this. Victor and I headed over to the police station quick. He wouldn't talk to me at all on the way over. Hell, I doubt he even cared I was there. He tried to keep himself calm, but I could tell by he was pushing down some deep anger. If I was in his position, I don't think I would have been able to keep quite as restrained. At the station, Victor and I informed Ari and Jennifer about what happened, leaving out the part where we met up with Lene. The question had come up in my mind as to why Miranda would not just be able to teleport herself out of wherever she was being held captive. You remember Leah? Ari asked. I nodded. Her power was negated by water. Similarly, all of our powers can be negated with the right knowledge. Miranda always kept that information to herself. We all did if we could. Somehow it seems that the twins found out about her weakness and used it against her. Jennifer added. You know what it is, right, Victor? Of course. It isn't something that they'd be able to know. Far as I knew, Miranda never told anyone what her weakness was except for me. He's right. There's no way she would have let something like that be known to any of us. Even if she trusted us, Miranda was always wary when it came to discussing or using her powers. Someone had to have told them, Ari said. The only people I can think would have known would be in our family, Jennifer said. Shit, it would have had to have been Lanai or Crea. Jennifer bit down on her lower lip. Crea, there was that name again, the sister that Lini had told us to watch out for. What are you talking about? Ari asked. Jennifer looked over at Ari, a troubled look on her face. If you know something, say it, Victor shouted his voice booming so loud that both Ari and I jumped. I could tell by Ari's expression that she had never seen Victor like this before. Those two are the only ones who could possibly know her weakness, Jennifer said. What makes you say that? I asked. Because they were around us when we were growing up. Hell with how out of it mom was, and with dad being gone for so long, they practically raised the rest of us until Ari was born. Jennifer glanced over at Ari. That was when Lanai left, and a couple of years later, Kriya did the same. During that time, it wouldn't be out of question that either of them could have learned her weakness. What reason would they have to tell Riley and Fife about it? Ari asked. I don't know. They seemed to care a lot about us at the time. The two of them both left without telling us why. The reason doesn't matter right now. All that matters is finding where they took her. You have to have something to go off of, Victor said. Jennifer shook her head. If we did, don't you think we would have already made a move? Besides, how the hell could you have allowed this to happen anyway? Weren't you with her? Something like this would have never happened if you did your job. Jennifer yelled. Hey, Jennifer, you don't have to be so... Ari was cut off when Victor raised his hand in front of her. She's right. I made a mistake leaving her alone because of that. I will stop at nothing to find her. Even if I have to kill those two myself... This wasn't the chilled-out guy I had come to know. That part of him was nowhere to be seen. Victor had a look of deadly seriousness as he made direct eye contact with Jennifer. There was no hesitation in his voice. 
I never thought him capable of killing someone before, but seeing him like this, I realized how wrong I must have been. That expression, I could tell that he wasn't lying. We have a problem, Reed burst into the room in a panic. Ferdinand is dead. Ferdinand, he was one of the detectives on the case. To think that I had just been talking with him some hours earlier in the day, and now he was dead. It almost felt unreal, like my mind just couldn't really comprehend the situation. What? Jennifer's voice fell away from her as I saw her eyes widen. He was at an ice cream shop with his daughter when a group of those cubs showed up and gunned him down. They also injured and killed a few other people at the shop, Reed explained. They weren't just targeting Miranda. Jennifer, what if they know everyone working on this case, Ari said. Reed, contact Coda right now and get a unit to head over to his home. We need him to get back here now. I'm going to call Straff and do the same. We have to make sure they aren't going for anyone else. Reed nodded and took out her phone to call Coda. As she tried to swiftly explain the situation to him over the phone, I could tell something was wrong. You hear gunshots in the building? Just stay put. We're gonna send help over to you. Fuck that. What's his address? A couple of cops aren't going to be able to do anything to help. I'll go. Victor said. You can't mean to. Jennifer was interrupted by Victor. Do you want him to end up dead? Just tell me where to go. Jennifer hesitantly told Victor the location of Coda's apartment, and he started to head out of the room. Watching him go, a thought popped into my mind. Victor, wait. I'll go with you. I spoke up. Kevin, what are you doing? Shouldn't you stay here? If you go out, they could... Ari grasped onto my jacket sleeve. I have an idea. Just... I just need you to trust me on this. I said, gently peeling Ari's fingers off my sleeve. Jennifer, I need you to let me borrow a tiger's blood pill. Why do you need that? Jennifer asked. I want to try and get some information out of them. Using their addiction against them would be the best way. I answered. It's the only thing I can think might work. Sure enough, she let me take one of the pills. I wasn't very confident if my plan would end up yielding any results or not, but we were running out of time and getting pushed against a wall. I slipped the small bag with the pill into my pocket and went over to join Victor. Kevin, Victor, I heard Ari say as we were leaving the room. Turning around, I could see she was on the verge of tears. Please stay safe. We'll be back, don't worry, Victor said. Yeah, it'll be fine, I said, trying to reassure Ari. Even though on the inside, I could feel dread starting to fill my stomach. I followed Victor out to his truck and we started driving towards Coda's apartment building as fast as possible. While my main reason for accompanying Victor was to try and get some information from the cubs that we would inevitably run into once we got to our destination, there was another reason. It was to try and make sure he didn't lose himself to his anger. I could feel it exuding from him like an aura. If his transformation was like mine, as he said, things could turn bad if he lost himself. Admittedly, there would have been little I could do to stop him if that happened. Even if that was the case, I couldn't in good conscience just let that happen. Another funny thing to think back on now, that stupid altruistic side of myself that did little but put Ari and me in more danger. Even though it causes so much trouble, I know I'd regret not acting on it. I might be a monster, but it's that sense of humanity that keeps me sane. The drive over there was quiet. While Victor did agree to let me come with, I couldn't really tell if he cared all that much. I wanted to ask him why he was so ready to go and help Coda, but I was unsure if I wanted to hear the answer. The way he was acting, while I understood why, still scared me a little. You... You won't kill them, will you? I finally asked. Why does that matter to you? Long as one is alive, we can learn where their hideout is. Victor replied. But they don't have any control over what they're doing. Maybe there is a way to turn them back to normal. That's wishful thinking, Kevin. You can't keep thinking of them as people. They're just puppets. How many lives are you willing to let them take and ruin just because maybe they can be helped? I... Whoever these people used to be... They're long gone, Victor said. Yeah. The way you're talking, you've seen this before, haven't you? I asked. Victor sighed. It was years ago. 
they did the same thing to people. The only difference was they were not using a drug then. The effects were the same. A person becomes a monster after being exposed to their magic. They're capable of doing horrible things, and they do it happily. There has to be some way to reverse the effects, right? Maybe. The only ones who know the answer to that are the ones behind this mess, though. We don't know where they are, and even if we did, they wouldn't tell us anything. In truth, I didn't want to avoid killing people because I looked at it as the right thing to do. It was more to do with the fact that I didn't want to risk losing myself. At that time, I wasn't even thinking about the fact that killing was an inevitability. That when I did finally come across Riley and Fife, that the only way this ends is with either them or Aerie dying. N That's not how it's supposed to work is what I'd tell myself. I held on to these notions that events had to play out a certain way because my mind just couldn't comprehend the alternatives. Thinking that I could play the hero and save people, that I could play out some childhood fantasy. I was naive. When we took a turn onto the street where Coda's apartment building was located, we were met with the visage of this horrible, brutal, vicious reality. Victor slammed on the brakes, the truck coming to a screeching halt. The street was littered with bodies. The cubs were dragging people out of the apartments as they kicked and screamed and were butchering them out in the open. Three cop cars were spread about the street, but it was clear that they did nothing to stem this absolute anarchy. People were being tossed from the fire escapes, their bodies breaking on the sidewalk. Others were being torn apart by cubs that were proceeding to feast on their organs and like rabid animals, cheering with excitement. Some were being dragged out and shoved into windowless white vans. My body started to shake as that dread I felt into the pit of my stomach morphed into unmitigated terror. This was impossible. A scene like this should never have been possible. How could this happen? My brain tried and failed over and over again to comprehend the display of bloody brutality unfolding right in front of my eyes. I couldn't believe it. It had to be fake, all of it. I shook my head and looked down towards my feet. The laughter and screams interspersed with gunshots gouged their way through my ear canal. I prayed and begged for it to end. I couldn't have been on Earth anymore. No, this was hell. Kevin! I heard Victor yell. Suddenly the window next to me broke, and hands gripped onto me, dragging me through it. My body hit the pavement hard as a couple of cubs pulled me away from the truck. One of the cubs held me down while the other slammed his baseball bat into my stomach, cackling to themselves. This was just a bad dream, right? Any moment I'd wake up in bed next to Aerie. Another blow from the bat crushed my guts, causing me to retch and cough. Those red eyes looking down at me with ear-to-ear -ear grins. Just a bad dream. It had to be. I watched the bat raise up into the air, ready to come crashing down on me again. Victor grabbed hold of the man before he swung down and delivered a punch across the man's jaw. He collapsed onto the ground behind me, and the other cub that was holding me down let go and charged at Victor, swinging at him wildly with a knife. Victor dodged at each swing and kneed the cub in the stomach before slamming his elbow into the back of the cub's neck, causing the man to crumple to the ground, his face smashing against the concrete. Victor quickly picked me up off of the ground and took me behind a nearby car. You need to snap out of it. We're here now. Let's do what we came to do. You need to head inside of the building and check the apartment, Victor said, placing his hand on my shoulder. It took me a few moments to process and bring myself back to reality. What are you going to do? I asked. Victor pointed over to the pair of windowless vans. He could be inside there. We also need to stop them from leaving with whoever they are trying to take. There were at least eight or nine cubs situated around the vans. They hadn't taken notice of us because of how engrossed into their self-indulgent violence they were. Nah. Are you sure you want to handle them alone? I asked. Don't worry about me, I'll be fine. You just move as fast as you can to the apartment. If you run into any of them, use this. Victor handed me a handgun. It is going to be too cramped inside that place to transform. It'd be more troublesome than it is worth to do it. I've never had to shoot a gun before, though, I said. It'll be close quarters. As long as you remain calm and aim, you'll be okay. The safety is already off, so if your finger is on the trigger, be sure you are ready to shoot. You have 12 bullets. If you run out, you will need to find another way to fight, 
Now take it. Hesitantly, I took the gun from Victor. Victor peered around the car over at the group of cubs again. When I go over there and they come at me, use that as a distraction to get inside the building without them noticing. All right? I nodded my head and prepared to run inside. Seeing the carnage on the streets, I could only hope that we hadn't shown up too late. Victor stood up and started to approach the group of cubs. Once they noticed him, a few of them immediately attacked him. Victor was able to easily evade the swings of their weapons, retaliating with punches and kicks, only needing to land one as the blow was utterly devastating to whoever he hit. I had thought he would end up transforming, but for whatever reason he held back from doing that. Judging from how effortlessly he was handling the cubs that were trying to kill him, it wasn't like his transformation even seemed needed. He was already a monster in just that human form. I sprinted towards Coda's apartment building, rushing up the stairs and through the open doorway. The moment I passed through the doorframe, I was stopped in my tracks. Standing just a few feet in front of me was one of the cubs. She had one hand grasping onto the hair of a battered, struggling young girl. She was dragging down the stairs and the other clutching onto a pistol. As the woman raised her pistol to aim at me, I found myself moving without even thinking about it. I lifted the gun in my hands and fired. The woman staggered down the stairs and fell in front of me. Blood trickled down from the bullet wound in the side of her skull as she looked up at me with unmoving eyes. My hands trembled as I looked down at the corpse that was staring back at me. I could feel the nausea growing and bile in my throat. Raising a hand to my mouth, I vomited through my fingers, causing a mess on the floor. I had killed someone without the filter of the wolf. Even if they were trying to kill me and I had no other choice, I couldn't stop myself from shaking. Uncontrollable tears started streaming down my face. I forced myself to look away from the corpse. There's something to be said about the feeling you get when you kill someone. I don't know what it would be like for somebody else. It happened so quickly in my case. Just a single pull of the trigger, no thought behind it. I just did it. And then a moment later, lying at my feet, was a young girl's corpse, staring up at me with cold, dead eyes and a smile on her face. Happy to be dead, I suppose. She couldn't have been much younger than me. I wonder if she was thinking about going to college, or if her parents were worried about her, or how scared she must have been when she was first abducted. These useless thoughts invaded my mind, thoughts of who the person I shot between the eyes was. I didn't want to kill anyone, at least that's what I believed. Yet, when I was staring down the barrel of that gun, all of my morality shrank away. It was that fear of death which seized control of my body. But I had no choice, it was either her or me. They acted like fiends, perhaps they deserved this even if it was the drug causing their behavior. As much as the act plagued my mind, I couldn't stand there and agonize over what I had done. The girl that was being dragged was sitting on the steps. She was shaking with terror, but looked mostly unhurt, save for a couple of minor bruises and scuffed knees. She was looking over at the body, staring at it with wide, unblinking eyes. I wiped my puke-covered hand on my jacket sleeve along with my mouth. I didn't give a shit how disgusting it looked. Not at that point. I needed to get to Coda and hope that he hadn't already been visited by the cubs. Stepping over the body, I walked towards the girl. Each step I took felt wobbly, and lightheadedness started to come over me. As I came closer to the girl, she broke out of her stupor in a panic. She immediately began sprinting up the stairs, nearly tripping in the process. As I followed her up the steps, I heard gunshots ringing out from the streets. I had to fight the urge to check outside on Victor. He could handle himself, right? He wouldn't have approached them like that if he couldn't. Still, I couldn't help the tightening in my chest as I started to worry about what may end up happening to him. Climbing up to the next floor, I found that the girl was heading in the same direction that I was going in, towards Coda's apartment. As I entered the corridor of the apartment, I caught a glimpse of the girl running through one of the doors. A lot of the doors had been kicked in, the insides of the rooms ransacked. I could hear yelling coming from the apartment that the girl had run into. Rushing towards it, I went inside where I was met with the sight of the man Victor and I had come to rescue. Coda's was battered and bloodied, his right arm hung limply at his side, 
bent in an unnatural angle at the elbow. His clothing was torn from the multiple knife wounds that littered his body. He was being held up by one of the cubs. At the same time, another was continuously slicing more gashes across Coda's chest and stomach. The girl was being held back by a man who was pulling her back towards the entrance to the apartment. When he caught sight of me and the gun in my hand, he shifted the girl in front of himself to use as a shield. In his free hand, he started to raise a pistol. Reactively, I went to raise my own gun but stopped realizing I would hit the girl. My mind raced, trying to figure out what to do in the split seconds until the man shot. I ended up doing the only thing I could think of at the time. I charged at the two of them. The distance wasn't very far, just a few feet. I pushed the man's arm to the side as shots rang out. My ears rang from the noise as I forced the girl away from him, pushing her towards the door. The man stumbled back a bit and tried to shoot at me again. I was able to pull the trigger first, however, and shot him multiple times across his torso. The man lurched back and slammed against the wall. As the bullet wounds that peppered him oozed blood, he tried again to raise the pistol to me. I shot again and again, until the gun uselessly clicked in my hands. The man began to slide down the wall, leaving behind him a red smear. An excruciating pain fired through my shoulder as one of the cubs that were assaulting Coda drove his knife into it. Ripping the blade out, the man raised it up to attack again. I turned the gun towards him, but my mind didn't register the fact that it was empty. Again the gun clicked, and the man swung the knife down. I just barely dodged out of the way of it, bumping into the other cub, a portly man, who had dropped Coda and was now joining in to attack me. The portly man grabbed my arms and tried to hold me still. I struggled against his grasp as I watched the man with the knife rushing at us, ready to stab. I forced the cub to turn, and the blade was driven into his belly. The fat man let out a moan as his grip loosened. I pushed myself away from both of them and turned to see the man with the knife drag it all the way through to the other side of the man's stomach. Blood and entrails gushed out of the wound, covering the floor. The man had this expression of absolute bliss as he collapsed onto the ground and bled to death. The last cub in the room didn't show a hint of remorse for what he did. If anything, it seemed he enjoyed it, still having that same toothy grin all of the cubs had when they were immersed in violence. The cub tackled me, the two of us tripping over an overturned coffee table. The man tried to bring the blade down into my chest, but I grabbed his hands, stopping the blade just as it began to pierce into my jacket. Slowly the blade began to sink into my flesh, causing me to cry out in pain as I tried desperately to push the knife back. As I felt the metal digging deeper into my body, I realized that unless I transformed, this man was going to kill me. Yet before I could attempt the change, another shot rang out, and the man collapsed to my side. Standing next to me was the girl. She was holding a handgun. She was breathing heavily, almost hyperventilating as her entire body shook. She dropped the gun and rushed over to Coda's side. Silently, she cradled him in her arms. I pushed myself up off of the ground and walked over to them. Miraculously, Coda was still breathing. Even though his body was in a completely messed up state, though it was clear he wouldn't be alive for long if we didn't get him some help soon. We need to get him out of here, it isn't safe, I said. Let me try and carry him out of here. We can try to get him some help. The girl was a little hesitant but allowed me to pick up Coda and lift him onto my back. I could feel the blood from his wounds seeping into my jacket. Coda didn't feel like he weighed very much when I picked him up. His weight felt like I was just picking up a backpack that was moderately packed. It was a little strange, but I pushed the thought aside and glanced over to the girl. Hey, you should grab that gun you dropped. If we come across any more of these people, we are going to need some way to defend ourselves, I said. The girl nodded and picked up the handgun. I also had her grab Victor's gun and hand it to me. Even if it was out of ammo, I felt like it wasn't a good idea to just leave it behind. Are you going to be okay to use that? The girl nodded again. I was starting to get a bit concerned about the fact that she hadn't said anything to me. What's your name? I asked as we exited the apartment. The girl reached into her pocket and took out a wallet, retrieving her ID from inside. Her name was Leslie Coda. She was the sister of the detective who was currently bleeding out on my back. You can't talk? The girl nodded once more. 
I guess that didn't really matter right now. The only concern I honestly had on my mind was getting far away from his place. We walked down the corridor towards the stairs, Leslie sticking to my side. The gunshots that were happening outside the building had come to a stop. Whether that was good or bad, I didn't know. As we got closer to the steps, a few cubs came barreling down the staircase. I readied myself for when they came charging at us, but they just continued further down the stairs. They ignored us entirely for whatever reason, even though they had to have seen us. I wondered what could have caused them to be in such a hurry. Picking up the pace, we headed down the stairs after them and got to the first floor just in time to see them running out the entrance. When we got outside, I could see Victor standing in the middle of the street. He was transformed, his body covered with gashes with chunks of flesh either torn out or hanging off his body. His fur was matted with blood as it dripped from his body to the asphalt. He wobbled back and forth, looking like he was about to collapse any moment, but was somehow managing to stay on his feet. Standing in front of him was something I didn't expect to see. They were a man and a woman with one arm. The two of them were transformed into these, how should I say, were tigers. Yeah, that would probably be the best way to put what they were. While the woman's form was slender, the man was hulking and muscular. Their hands had turned to paws with blood-drenched white claws, and each of them had a pelt with a snow tiger-like pattern. They were familiars they had to be. Taking another look at the one-armed woman, it clicked in my head. That was one of the twins, but who was the guy? Both of them were also severely injured as well. In particular, the man had a gaping hole in his shoulder the size volleyball. The street itself looked like a war zone, with overturned cars all over the place, bodies spread all across the ground. There was something strange about the bodies. It was like they had been mummified or deflated in a way, their skin hanging over their bones as if they had no muscle mass whatsoever. God damn, you two were right. This guy's a fucking monster. This shit just got a whole lot more fun. A shame we have to call it here, the man said. I watched as the cubs that left the building sprinted into the vans. Tell me where she is, Victor choked out as he started slowly walking towards the two were tigers. I won't let you leave until you tell me. Whoa there, cowboy, don't you worry, she'll be taken good care of. Besides, it seems your friends over there might be in a bit of trouble. Right, Riley? The man said with a devious tone. Riley. It was without a doubt now that the one-armed were a tiger was one of Ares' sisters. Yet why was she able to transform? Could the witches just do this? And I was not aware. One of the cubs that headed for the vans rushed over to Riley as the man reverted back to his human form and limped towards the passenger side door of one of the vans. Riley dug her claw into the cub's chest and ripped through it. A red glow surrounded her paw as she raised it to the sky. I watched it in disbelief as the cub's blood was sip on it out of his body in mere seconds. His body became like that of the one is covering the ground, a dried up husk. All of his blood coalesced into dozens of crimson orbs that floated in the air above Riley. Slowly the spheres began to form into spikes and crystallize, and Riley glanced over towards Coda, Leslie, and myself. Even realizing what was about to come for us, there was nothing I could do to react in time. The blood spikes came soaring through the air at us with incredible speed, and I closed my eyes, bracing myself for the onslaught. However, I didn't feel anything touch me. Opening my eyes, I saw Victor standing in front of me. He was holding up one of the nearby cars and using it to shield the three of us from Riley's attack. The sounds of the crystallized blood scraping against the metal as it gouged into the car was deafening. Around us, I could see the spears not blocked by the car shattering on the sidewalk and the apartment building behind us. When it ended, Victor pushed the car over in time to see the vans rounding a corner at the end of the street. Victor clenched his fist and fell to his hands and knees, reverting back to normal in the process. I could hear the sounds of sirens coming closer and looking down the other end of the street, could see a couple police cars approaching. Fuck, how could I just let them get away? While I couldn't see his face, I did notice the tears falling from it and onto the concrete. Behind me, Leslie was beyond terrified, cowering from Victor. Though when she saw him sobbing on the ground, she became less afraid. 
I was at a loss for words. I knew there was nothing that I could say to him to make the situation better. While we had managed to find Coda, there were still a lot of people taken, and we had no way of locating where Miranda was taken. The plan I had to getting that information was worthless now since there didn't seem to be a living cub around. I couldn't help but feel like it was my fault. Why was I so slow to get to Coda? Why was I so terrible at dealing with those cubs? Because I was scared. Because I didn't want to kill them. All of this hesitation I had, these fears, they did nothing but hold me back and result in more harm than good. I should have been able to help Victor. Instead, he was left on his own to fight those two were tigers by himself. Coda was taken to a hospital shortly after the authorities arrived, accompanied by Leslie. I wondered if it was a good idea to just leave Leslie alone after what she had seen, but something told me that I doubt it was going to be a problem. Besides, I'm sure it was something that Jennifer could probably handle. Both Victor and I headed back to the police station. I told him that he should maybe get some medical attention himself, but he didn't pay any mind to that suggestion. Not that I blame him. His mind wasn't really on his personal well-being at the moment. At least he seemed to be all right physically. His body was still covered with various injuries, but nothing that looked too awful. I'm sorry, I should have been able to help you, I muttered as we drove back. It's not your fault, Victor replied. It is, if I wasn't so useless back there we could have ended all of this. But I was afraid, even though I have this power, I still get so afraid. Being scared is not a bad thing, you're not prepared for someone like them. If you had tried to help me, then you may have ended up dead. I don't think I would have been able to face Ari if that happened. Of course he would end up saying something like that. Even if Victor held some resentment towards me, I doubt he would ever say it to my face. But I don't think he was wrong either. Seeing just what Riley was capable of was terrifying. That, combined with the fact that she was also able to transform, meant that fighting her would be much more dangerous than Leah. Not to mention that I had no idea as to what the twins' weakness was, so negating their magic was out of the question. The fact that there were going to be two of them to deal with was just some extra salt in the wound. Still, the fact that Victor was able to handle all of that stuff by himself was pretty astonishing. I found it hard to believe all of that was just from his experience of working out and boxing. I had to wonder if there was something else to him that he hadn't told me about. Whatever it was, I wasn't about to bring it up with him here. Still, it was clear to me that there was a lot more to him than he was letting on.